Much to the chagrin of worldwide socialism, ladies and gentlemen, we're back. You're listening to The Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. And I'm Carolyn Nelson. And, uh, folks, uh, I was wondering when some of you were going to catch on. We're starting to get calls from people who are watching Bo Greitz's Spike video very carefully. And they're beginning to see the light. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you what's there, folks. I'm just going to let you... Uh, uh, we're going to see how many intelligent people out there have been listening to this program and can spot the symbology of the mystery religion of Babylon. You see, even Greit slaps at you. I think it's hilarious. But some people are catching on. They're calling us and telling us what they found. And uh, it's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Going to... Uh, what happened to that fax? Where is it? Oh, so interesting. Hmm, I've been infiltrated. Oh, so interesting. I <laughs> uh, got to read you something that's extremely important here, ladies and gentlemen. You've got to know this and uh, pay attention. Write this down. If you don't have pen and paper, get it now, right now. I don't know why I have to tell you that every night. Every night. Every night, somebody's sitting out there with no paper, no pen. Oh, wait a minute now. Uh, most people now, when they telephone, they have paper and pen right with them. Good. <laughs> That's good, folks. Yeah, I know. I'm just talking to the sheeple that haven't learned yet, trying to bring it home to them. Because invariably, they hear something that they wish they'd written down, and they call Carolyn and say, I didn't, I didn't uh, get that when you said it. Listen to this. Write it down. Take action. Another one of your freedoms is at stake here. We don't have many left, you know. U.S. Congress is attempting, folks, to impose teacher certification requirement on home schools and private schools. The freedom of virtually all home schoolers is at stake. Now, I'm telling you, if Congress imposes teacher certification on home schools, essentially all home schoolers, will lose their freedom to teach their own children. And you know what that means? Me, personally, I don't care what kind of laws they pass. They will not stop me from teaching my child the truth. Nor will my child attend their brainwashing facilities. Will not happen. And they have no jurisdiction over me. Because they have declared war upon me and they have destroyed my country. But, I want everybody to take action on this. We have to fight the battle every way that we can fight it for as long as we can fight it. House Resolution 6. House Resolution 6 is the reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. The bill is over 700 pages long. 700 pages long. You must get it and read it. House Resolution 6. It's an extensive and dangerous increase of federal control over all forms of education, public, private, and home schools. Now, we've been advised that this bill will be on the floor of the House on February the 24th, so time is of the essence. Time is of the essence. You know, this is the 16th. Eight more days, folks which means you have to start calling now, call all day tomorrow, call every day. Call as many times as you can. Call repeatedly. Don't just call once. Call 40 times if you can get through. Write. Facts. 
telegram. If you can, go personally to see your congressman and your senator and beat on their desk, yell in their face. Don't listen to all this Radio Freemasonry crap. Be nice to your congressman. They're not nice to you. Tell them like it is. Tell it like it is. Tell them you're mad and let them see that you're angry. Beat on their desk. If they call the guards and they haul you away, that's okay. I bet you got the point across. And getting angry is not against the law, folks. Yet. Yet, that's right. Maybe tomorrow. The provision in the bill which would require teacher certification is Section 2124E. That's Section 2124E. It's a recent amendment by Representative George Miller, Democrat, of course, from California. Of course, the People's Republic is always stirring up the pot. The People's Republic of California has sent George Miller, Democrat, to the Congress to put Section 2124E in the bill to make sure that you can't homeschool your kids. It says, Assurance. Each state applying for funds under this title shall provide the Secretary with the assurance that after July the 1st, 1998, it will require each local educational agency within the state to certify that each full-time teacher in schools under the jurisdiction of the agency is certified to teach in the subject area to which he or she is assigned. Now, the definitions of elementary school and secondary school folks include the word non-profit, this changes the federal definition of schools to clearly include private and home schools. Remember what we told you about the meaning of words. They don't mean what you think they mean. In many cases, they mean something entirely different. In this case, it includes private and home schools, simply because they have that phrase non-profit in there. Now, Watch how they do this. Remember what I taught you about socialism? Socialists need a daddy. Daddy's got to provide everything. Daddy's got to change their diaper. Daddy's got to give them lunch money. Daddy's got to make sure that they have a car to drive and all this bullshit. Listen to the first line, folks. Remember what I told you? Remember how it's done? Whoever gives a benefit is entitled to control. Understand that. And I'll tell you something. If you can't pay to educate your own kids in your own state, then you're not worth very much, in my estimation. Why are you accepting funds from the federal government? Where do you think the funds come from, dummies? Listen to this. Assurance. Each state applying for funds under this title shall provide the Secretary with the assurance that after July 1st, 1998, it will require each local educational agency within the state to certify that each full-time teacher in schools under the jurisdiction of the agency is certified to teach in the subject area to which he or she is assigned. Each state applying for funds under this title, each state applying for funds under this title, each little child asking Daddy for an allowance... Wake up, babies. You want to be 21? Want to go drink a beer? Want to come in after midnight? Want to be free? Pay your own way. Pay your own way, dummies. The money either originally comes out of your pocket, makes this big round circle through the federal government, during which time it loses much of its value and comes back to you and you think it's free. You think you're getting something for nothing from Big Daddy Federal Government. And if it doesn't come from your state, then it's borrowed from the Federal Reserve Banks, and you have to pay back not only what's borrowed, but the interest, dummies. Free, huh? Yeah, the Federal Government is going to improve your educational system by giving you funds and telling you what to do. You better stop this. Get on it. Get on it. H.R. 6, House Resolution 6. We'll be on the floor of the House on February the 24th as it's scheduled right now. Call every talk show host in the world. Get this out. Tell everybody to call. Congressman Dick Arney, 
Republican Texas proposed the following amendment, ladies and gentlemen. Quote, nothing in this title shall be construed to authorize or encourage federal control over the curriculum or practices of any private religious or home school. This proposed amendment was rejected. It was rejected by a straight party line vote. All Democrats voted against this amendment and all Republicans voted for it. Now why would Democrats vote against an amendment? so that there is no federal control over the curriculum or practices of any private religious or home school? Well, folks, you should be able to answer that by yourself, so I won't tell you. I will trust you to know. Well, somebody will call after the show, after the show and uh, ask why. Well... They could argue that homeschoolers were not intended to be included. However, in light of the rejection of the Army Amendment, in other words, they all voted against it, and the definition of school, then we know that it does. Now, Homeschool Private School Freedom Amendment has been submitted, folks, and it provides, one, nothing in the Act shall be construed to permit, allow, encourage, or authorize any federal involvement with or control over any aspect of private schools, religious schools, or home schools. Such federal involvement of control is expressly prohibited. This prohibition shall pertain to every federal statute, law, or regulation which does not expressly reference this section and make an exception thereto. Two, no federal funds allocated under this act shall be used by any state agency, local educational agency, or any other agency of government for the purpose of monitoring, controlling, regulating, or supervising any private school, religious school, or home school, except to the extent expressly required by this act relative to federal funds received by students attending such private school, religious school, or home school. As used anywhere in this act, the term school shall mean a public school and shall not include private school, religious school, or home school, unless specifically stated otherwise. Folks, my home school, my home school has just become a tutelage, and I have just become a tutor. So put that in your pipe and smoke it, and I'll be right back after this short pause. Dancing around this studio. It's incredible. Ah, uh, here we go, folks. These are remarks of the Honorable Lawrence H. Smith of Wisconsin in the House of Representatives, Wednesday, May 4th, 1955. 1955. 
Mr. Smith of Wisconsin, Mr. Speaker, there are people in our country today who would surrender our national sovereignty to a fictitious form of world government. That's the first sentence. Just to pique your interest, from the Congressional Record Appendix, Congressional Record Appendix, May 4th, 1955, page A3016, page A3016. Under leave to extend my remarks, I am including an article that appears in the current issue of the American Legion magazine by Zane B. Thurston, What You Should Know About World Government. At its National Convention, 1951 National Convention, the American Legion adopted a resolution which said in part, we reiterate our opposition to the participation of the United States in any form of world federation, world government, or in any intermediate federative organization, which would in whole or in part involve the sacrifice of sovereignty of the United States. The Legion again amplified this strong opposition in a resolution at its 1954 National Convention. In so doing, the Legion has rendered a great service to our constitutional republic, by calling our attention to the inherent dangers of the world government notion. It is well to establish at the outset that an idealistic and nebulous abstraction hovering in the minds of intellectual daydreamers. It is very real. It is high-powered, and it is a liberally financed movement, supported by many groups here and abroad, dedicated to the task of creating a federal union of the world. My personal interest in the world government idea, over and above the prompting of my natural religious and patriotic instincts, stems from the fact that one of its main protagonists is a fellow townsman. Indeed, much of the spade work which has been done in this country was done less than two miles from my home at the so-called Dublin Conference in early 1945. 1945. Did you hear that, folks? 1945. The climax of the work at these conferences and since will be the attempt by the United World Federalists Incorporated, one of the most powerful groups pressing for world government in this country, to expedite their plan of transforming the United Nations into a world government when its charter comes up for amendments in July of this year. It is not my purpose to analyze, criticize the many specifications, requirements, provisions, and restrictions of the various world government schemes which the American Legion obviously considers to be inimical to the continued sovereignty and independence of our constitutional republic. Rather, I shall dwell upon those inherent contradictions, fake promises, and ridiculous notions that render the theory of world government unoperable and impracticable in itself. The avowed supreme goal of world government advocates is the creation of a federal government embracing all the nations of the world. This they consider to be the only conceivable way to establish and preserve world peace. Extremely vocal prior to and during the World War II and in the late 40s, they found expression in such organizations as Federal Union Incorporated, the Atlantic Union Committee, the United World Federalists Incorporated, and various other lesser groups. Before any valid argument can be made against the theory, the best possible case for the opposition must be fairly and objectively established and can best be accomplished by quoting directly from their literature, speeches, and public pronouncements. Folks, that's always the best way, because they always lie, and they always have their facts wrong, and they always tinker Tinker with statistics. For instance, in the total of number of people killed by handguns in the United States are criminals killed by police officers in the performance of their duties. Last night, when I read to you the speech of Mr. Owens from New York proposing a resolution to repeal the second article and amendment of the Constitution, we talked about a, a boy who had stolen a handgun and had killed a bunch of people. 
Well, what Mr. Owens didn't tell you folks is that the father of that boy was a police officer and the handgun that he stole was his father's service revolver. <laughs> ah, Chihuahua. I think I'll go to Mexico too. <laughs> Oh, sometimes this is so hilarious, I just can't stand it. Oh, boy. I wonder if, uh, well, never mind. It's amazing. I continue. A brochure entitled, Let's Not Make the Same Mistake Twice, published by Federal Union Incorporated, very aptly states their reason for existence and can be fairly presented as representing the motivations of all world government agitators, even though not all would subscribe to the Federal Union plan. The brochure, in effect, says, quote, in fact, it says verbatim, quote, after the war will come something called peace. <laughs> oh, you, please forgive me, folks, but uh, these, uh, these socialists can, can be, you ever sit down and watch a two-year-old kid play and it, they just crack you up, you just laugh on every five minutes? Well, that's what happens when you watch socialists at work, too. Because they are two-year-old children. Uh, i got to read this again because uh, my whole train of thought, everything, is just wiped out. The brochure says, quote, <laughs> After the war will come something called peace. <clears throat> and it is equally the duty of every American to bear in mind that the fate of democracy and our own future will depend not alone on the outcome of the war, but on the outcome of that peace also. <laughs> Piece of cake. I'm sorry, what did you say, Carolyn? Piece of cake. Piece of cake is right. <laughs> Devil's food cake, as a matter of fact. <clears throat> oh, boy. And you notice they use the word democracy? Uh, socialists have never understood what a republic is. They've never referred to this nation as a republic. You see, the Soviet Union was a democracy. Cuba is a democracy. This is not a democracy. This is a republic, dear socialists. A republic, mind you. Oh, boy. It will depend upon the outcome of the peace. We need a peace aim, no less than a war aim, for victory. We helped to win the last war. We lost the peace. Now we are at the crossroads again. Why? Because you socialists won't keep your fingers out of everybody's business. That's why. Dummies. Unbelievable. Carolyn's cracking up so much she can't even, can't even breathe over here. <coughs> we lost the peace. We didn't lose anything, folks. We didn't, we didn't lose a thing. We, we didn't have any business in any, either one of those wars. Now we're at the crossroads again. Why? Do we, the free peoples of the earth, know where we expect to go? Have we a plan to attain an orderly, peaceful, prosperous world based on freedom? Up until now, the answer has been no. But there is an answer now. Federal Union is such a belief. Federal Union is a faith in an expanding democracy and in an expanding, embracing democratic way of life for the whole world. Now, translated, that means, folks, that we don't like the way you guys live in all the different countries in the world, and what we're going to do is we're going to snatch you up, slap down your sovereign boundaries, and we're going to force you to be a part of the United Nations, whether you want to be or not. We're going to force you to be free in our world democracy. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And we have none of that Bill of Rights stuff, you Americans, you see. You know, we're going to take care of you. No matter who you are, what you do, whether you're hungry or not, we're going to feed you. <laughs> and even if your diaper's clean, we're still going to change it. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. I wonder what it would be like if all the socialists had to live together in one spot. And there was nobody else there, just them. <laughs> what would they do? What would they do, folks? I would love to see some kind of an experiment like that. I think it would be hilarious. 
The organ outlines a strong but flexible union composed of the English-speaking democracies to be open to other nations as they develop or restore democratic rights. Whatever that means. It further proposes that the union would guarantee every citizen the individual rights set forth in our Bill of Rights, the rights of free men. Now, we know that that's false because in the United Nations there is no Bill of Rights. They have never attempted to create any Bill of Rights. And in all the charters and so-called proposed constitutions of the world federalists, there has never been any Bill of Rights, proposals for Bills of Rights, adoption of our Bill of Rights, nor any, any concern about individual freedoms whatsoever. It's all, it's all about the individual must suffer for the good of the whole. And even if we end up with a, with a state that's supreme and only one human being on this earth, it will be better than the world is now. And the state will be supreme over that one human being. And we'll take care of that human being, feed him, change his diaper, and give him a job. And there'll be no aggression. That's right. And if there is, the state will smack down that one lone left remaining human being and then finally the great socialist totalitarian state will reign supreme over all the world in all its lonely glory and humanity will disappear from the face of the earth <laughs> oh I'm taking a little a little freedom here folks but you know what we have to inject some humor into this sometimes and I know that there's some socialist out there scratching his head saying, that's not funny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, what they give us isn't funny either. That's right. We're fixing to give it all back to them. Only, <laughs> you know what? I think every socialist in the world should be given an enema tomorrow at 6 a.m. I think that that would give them a completely different outlook for the rest of the day anyway. What do you think, folks? <clears throat> well, maybe I should get serious. Each, let me see, where we get? Oh, here we go. Going to guarantee everybody everything. And it uh, graciously suggests that it be abandoned for something better if something better can be found. I can't believe that. Here they're saying that what they propose is better than anything that there ever was, and it's got to be, and then they're saying, they suggest that it be abandoned for something better, if something better can be found. I didn't know that socialists recognized that there could be anything better. That's promising anyway. Not being a true world government plan, that is, not including all the nations of the world, this plan has been forced into oblivion by a larger and more aggressive group, the United World Federalist, Federalist Incorporated, the main contenders in the world government arena of this country today. Now remember, that was in 1955, folks. Each prominent figures as former Senator Robert C. or G. Uh, Hendrickson of New Jersey shouted for world government, making an impassioned plea on the floor of the Senate in July 1949, he called for the ratification of the Atlantic Pact, eventual Atlantic Federal Union, and ultimate world government. Owen J. Roberts, retired Justice of the United States Supreme Court, Robert J. Patterson, former Secretary of War, Harold I. looks like uh, it is, former Secretary of the Interior, Will L. Clayton, Joseph C. Uh, Grew, William Phillips, and Robert Woods uh, Blass, all former Under Secretaries of State, were all officers of the aforementioned Atlantic Union Committee Incorporated. That side of the page for the folks on the left, uh, I guess the page was bent a little bit in the copier, and it uh, was very difficult to read, so I hope you understand why I was pausing and... Uh, in, in, in inappropriate places. This committee sponsored Senate Concurrent Resolution 4, House Concurrent Resolution 26, with the active support of 28 senators and 84 congressmen. 
The resolution stated that whereas federal union in this country had secured prosperity and abundance for Americans, the President be requested to invite the democracies which sponsored the North Atlantic Treaty to a convention to explore the possibilities of forming within the framework of the United Nations the principles of free federal union, the avowed end result of which was to establish an Atlantic Federal Union as a necessary first step toward ultimate world government. And they did it, folks, and it was called NATO. NATO. The same United Nations police force that's operating in Europe and Bosnia right this moment. Well, <clears throat> it is, once again, that time. We must go for a short break. Don't go away, folks. We'll be right back after this very short pause. Folks, I went out today and uh, put in my order so I know mine is secure. Now, you better do the same before Monday night, because after Monday night, you will be not be able to find one in the entire country. And I'm telling you right now, we were only able to find five, and I've got one of them. I've got one of them. <clears throat> if this country were invaded and occupied by an enemy force intending to enslave the American people and destroy the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, you might consider wanting to own a sniper weapon, one of the best there is. Now, I'm telling you right now, the best there is is only in a few hands, and you can't go buy it anywhere at all. You can't. In other words... <clears throat> you have to make it yourself on Monday. We're going to tell you how to do that. We're going to tell you how to do it, folks. And it's only to be used in defense of the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and our freedoms. But you see, we're going to give away the secrets on Monday, and you're not going to be able to find what you need in order to have one. So I'm going to tell you right now, don't delay. Don't stop. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Don't procrastinate because you will not find one after Monday night, and you may not find one after tonight. But you need a caliber three seventy five rifle with the longest barrel that you can get, with the best action that you can find. H&H &H is an excellent example. Weatherby is a good example. Anything coming from Belgium is good. These are rare because they're big game rifles. Now, you're not going to understand why I'm telling you this until Monday night. Monday night, it will all be made clear. So, if you want the best rifle in the world that you can possibly, possibly have to defend your country at some future date, 
should it become necessary to do so by modifying the rifle completely, 100% legally, in fact, to be able to reach out to 1,500 yards. We can't hit 1,700 because that action has gone. But we can get you out to 1,500 yards, folks. 1,500 yards. Think about it. You need a 375 caliber rifle with the longest barrel you can find and the best action from a company that has a reputation for building accurate firearms. Monday night, we'll tell you the rest of the story. In the meantime, you're going to need to protect the declining value of your dollar. Have you been watching the news lately? Somebody must have listened to my shows recently because now you're parroting what I told you and nobody said it before I did. Remember, nobody said it before I did. What's coming with this trade war with Japan, it's building. Things are going to get hot, it looks like. You need gold, silver, platinum. You need these coins. And folks, what we're going to teach you to do with this weapon, first, the weapon itself is going to cost you a bundle. And what we're going to teach you to do on Monday night is going to greatly expand upon that cost. Call Swiss America Trading. Do it now. Do it right now. Look around at the faces of your loved ones. Can you tell them that you have provided for their financial future? Can you tell them that you have invested in something that won't disappear, like paper in a puff of smoke or in a declining market? Or just by decree? Can you do that? Most of you I know can't. Most of you I also know are irresponsible. Even though you know you can't, you still won't make the call. But those of you who know you must, know you should, know what your responsibility is, do it. Call now. 1-800-289-2646. one 289 2646 Thank them for sponsoring the Hour of the Time. Mention my name, William Cooper, and ask them to send you all the newsletters and the information that you're entitled to as a listener to the hour of the time. Ask them, ask them for all the different programs that they have available, or if you have something in mind, tell them what you have in mind that will protect your assets against what's coming. 1-800-289-2646. That's 1-800-289-2646. Do it now, folks. Do it now. You'll be glad that you did.
sucks. It's disruptive. It takes away your dignity. It takes away everything. Remember how you felt as a kid? You felt like you weren't anybody. Couldn't wait to get out of the house and be free. Well, that was mild compared to socialism. Very, very, very mild. Well, we're going to go to the phones. You've heard it. Read it to you tonight. That was how NATO began. That was the first steps toward forming NATO, which was going to be one of the first steps besides the United Nations toward world government. It is, in fact, NATO. NATO did, in fact, unite the military forces and, through the military forces, the governments of Europe, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, preparing for world government. Good evening, you're on the air. Hello. Boy, I'll tell you what. During that first half hour, you just called and called and called and called. And when we finally put you on the air, you just ran and ran and ran and ran and ran. 602-333-2174. Folks, if you haven't got the guts to talk, don't bother calling. And if you can't wait for a couple of minutes when we put you on hold, don't bother calling. You're just wasting our time, and you're wasting yours. Good evening. You're on the air. Oh, hi, Bill Cooper. Uh, it's Moy in Tucson. Hello. I think I have a, 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 a news flash that you may not have heard of I'd like to pass along to you. Go ahead. Uh, the Arizona Graham County Sheriff. I said it last night. <laughs> uh, okay, that's great. Are you aware that there's going to be a meeting of sheriffs in Phoenix tomorrow? Uh, run by uh, Bob Corbin of the NRA, and they're going to try to get all the sheriffs to be plaintiffs on uh, Sheriff Mack's uh, uh, plaint uh, suit. Yes. Good. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, did you hear that, folks? I was saving that toward the end of the program. But uh, there's a meeting taking place tomorrow. All the sheriffs in the state of Arizona are meeting to become co-plaintiffs on the suit filed by the Graham County Sheriff against the United States government, and it looks like that all the sheriffs in the state of Arizona are not going to enforce the Brady Bill. Told you, folks, we got it together out here pretty much, except for the Freemasons down in Phoenix, who named it Phoenix, who named it the Valley of the Sun, who called it the Sun Devil Stadium, and the Phoenix team is called the Suns. <laughs> But they pretty much stay there. You see, we got them surrounded. <laughs> Except for uh, Navajo County Sheriff is a 32nd degree Freemason. We also know that he has been spending money on FEMA uniforms and uh, other things to uh, help bring about the New World Order. And uh, I think the people in Navajo County are fixing to wake up to this and uh, boot, that, boot that Mr. Butler right out on his butler, I guess. So uh, how about that? He's still there? He's gone. Okay, 602-333-2174. If you live in Navajo County in the state of Arizona, get rid of Butler. He's a 32nd degree Freemason. He is conspiring with the federal government to take away your rights. He's already spent money on FEMA uniforms. And he lies a lot. Good evening. You're on the air. Hello, Bill. Hello. Hey, I made it through on the uh, computer. Did it real well. Good. It was a been a phone problem last night. Yeah. Uh, Bill. Uh, I was able to get a hold of a copy of Vampire 2000, but I can't get anybody that knows anything more than just what's in the uh, in the pamphlet. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? What's there to elaborate? It's what you've been learning and hearing on this show. That's yeah, true, but is uh, only you hear it in more uh, detail, and uh, you heard it a lot before they ever printed that on this show. Okay. Well, I've only been on the show about two months. Uh huh. It's pretty self-explanatory. What do you What do you want to know? Well, that's uh, that's my point exactly. Living out east, I'm the only one that has a copy, and uh, it seems to be uh, uh, only picked up in the southwest, and nobody out in the east is picking it up. And I'm wondering why. You got a copy shop nearby? Uh, well, I've got three or four copies. I can't hand them out. Everybody hands them back. I can't help that. I mean, you know, a fool is a fool every day of the week. I was just wondering if there was, uh, if, if you had any more activity on that that uh, could be... Uh, activity on what? On Vampire 2000, if there was any more than what I just had, the pamphlet itself. No, uh, I'm not involved in it. Okay. 
the uh, uh, sheriff's, um, I forgot the uh, endorsements on the bottom of it. They are legitimate. Uh, so I can't find out from anyone here. Well, uh, what difference would it make? Our admonition is to listen to everybody, read everything. Start your own uh, project of research. And once you do that, you're going to find out more than you'll ever read in there or in my book or any place else, for that matter. And then you can write your own Vampire 2000. Yeah, well, that, I understand. I think you're missing my point, and I, I see your point. Well, I've been trying to get what your point is. <laughs> well, is I can't find enough about it or just like your show's the only one that's, that's, that's coming forward, okay? Yeah. I'm trying to get some insights on some help on how to get this thing out other than just walking up and handing it to people. Well, I don't know any other way unless you want to mail it to people or unless you get a network of friends that want to help. Uh, but you can't force anybody to take anything, you know. Well, you, you can say that again. About, about the most you can do is to try to encourage them to listen to shortwave and uh, sooner or later they might respond. Are you there? Yeah, yeah. I took uh, my radio up to the uh, place that I hang out at a uh, tool and die shop today. And uh, they didn't want to hear a tape from you last night. Uh, I took Bear Bar 2000 laid it on the table up there for a month and it was never touched. Well, you know, I got one piece of advice for you if that's the case. If everybody living around you is that kind of a person, you know what my advice is? Don't listen. Move quick. <laughs> Relocate. Uh, Find some real people and go live with them. Uh, we, we talked about that last week. Well, <laughs> put that plan into action. Thank you for calling. All right. Six zero two three 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 two one seven four is the number. And uh, later on the program tonight, we're going to get into the executive order starting about 1917, actually, and go right up as far as we can go during that hour. And I would suggest you to, by the way, tonight, the first half hour was number 10 in the Treason series. The later show tonight will be number 11. Good evening. You're on the air. Yeah, last night you were talking about uh, picking up night vision from the former Soviet Union. Highly recommend against it. It leaks light. Even though they call it passive, through the late model U.S. stuff, it glows at night. And it targets you with something horrendous. Just wanted to pass that on. Thank you. Okay. Good night. I think there's something extremely suspicious about all this Soviet stuff uh, being made available to American citizens anyway. Uh, everything that I have is uh, that uh, that would possibly give me away has been checked, double checked, triple checked, and uh, can't do it. So, but that was a good call. Thank you. Good evening. You're on the air. Hello, William. Yes. How are you tonight? I'm fine. How are you doing? First time I've called you, I wanted to uh, thank you for your. Uh, almost casual mention, probably of, of maybe the first thing I've heard about a, a turnaround. I'm, I'm kind of a, of the mindset of uh, survival. Uh, uh, it was interesting. I was uh, cleaning my uh, Accurized 30 out 6 caliber, which isn't bad at a few hundred yards. Uh, when you mentioned the, the sheriff uh, from uh, Graham County, Arizona, uh, I called. Uh, all the local radio stations, and uh, he's, he got booked, I understand now, quite extensively down here to be on the air, so it looks like uh, that you, uh, sir, and, and uh, my hats off to you, have, have let a major cat out of the bag. You know, all we've been hearing about on the waste of time news media is, is uh, griping politicians, weenie wankers, and ice skaters. You know? so, so quit watching it. Quit listening to it. Well, we, well I don't. But uh, 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 Sheriff uh, Mac, uh, well, I guess well, he'll be the famous, more famous than uh, McDonald's Big Mac in my book. Uh, he's actually going to be on a talk show tonight uh, live in, in Austin at 11 p.m. So. Yep. Uh, he competes with you tonight, but... But I'll tell you what, uh, the cat's out of the bag, and, and I think uh, it's going to get some PR, and, it, and it's uh, all due to you. And uh, I think it, it'll have some uh, major political ramifications with these uh, sheriffs. Uh, 
especially the ones that Big Mel said they were against the Brady Bill. Well, now the ball is really in their court. Yeah, they're going to they're gonna have to prove it now, aren't they? No, you got, if you got one sheriff that, that knows the Constitution and that says, hey, you, you guys uh, can't screw with me, we're not going to enforce this Brady Bill. Like they can't. It's against the Arizona State Constitution, and it's against the United States Constitution. Correct, the mundo. And, uh, and when the other, uh, when, you know, I would measure my uh, sheriff candidate uh, by that uh, rule. If, uh, I would say, hey, you said you were, uh, you know, for gun ownership. Now, you, are you going to enforce this Brady bill? Well, let's see how many back peddlers we got, and, and uh, any constitutionalist should surely turn out the sheriff in, uh, in, or support the sheriff in the election, but uh, I really uh, I think America owes the, uh, the constitutional, the, the uh, uh, Bill of Rights people really owe you a debt of gratitude for letting that out. Well, may not have got out. Well, it, it, it may not have, that's the truth. And, uh, it probably would have, <laughs> but... Uh, yeah, we've been faxed, and I'm going to fax gun owners. What do you think of them? What do you mean? At the Gun Owners of America organization. I'm not too hot on the NRA, but... Uh, the NRA uh, is not on our side. I, I feel that way, too. Uh, the, the gun owners, they were they sounded a little bit... Gun Owners Association of America? Listen, don't, don't ask me uh, how they are. Watch what they do. Well... Listen to what they say. I'm wondering if these guys are aware of this. If you don't hear any of them say treason, if you don't hear any of them telling it like it is, then they're not on our side. Simple as that. I'm talking about informing them and, and spreading the word. I, I got some calls from some individuals who I don't even know today uh, that wanted to know more about this. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think it's... Uh, you're the only one that broke the story. It may never have gotten out of Arizona. Well, I got another story I'm going to break right now, as a matter of fact, since we're talking about breaking stories. We have another story to break. I broke the story about the the uh, atomic energy people sneaking around north of Snowflake, Oklahoma, uh, Snowflake Arizona, uh, looking for a spot to uh, build an atomic reactor under the guise of building a fish farm. And I'm going to break another story. They plan to start construction and break ground within 60 days, and the completion target date is in seven years from that date. What's, what's the difference between a fish farm and a nuclear reactor, Dick? I don't know. <laughs> you know. One's got water with fish in it, and the other one's got water with fish, fish, living, or fish living around it, or fish drinking it. <laughs> That's a good one. But, uh, again, the, for the third time, thank you, America. Thank you on this. And... Uh, and that Owens thing that you read the other night from that uh, fellow from New York? Yeah. I, I almost feel like faxing him and telling him, your Brady Bill is in the trash can, and uh, and I think it's great. The, the Brady Bill, as far as I, I've been announcing that the Brady Bill is dead. I think it is. You know, somebody should make up a, a picture of Mr. Owens standing with a piece of paper in his hand that says, repeal the Second Amendment, and an outraged citizen smacking him in the mouth. Uh, everybody in the country should fax that picture to them. I, I'd like to fax him something, but uh, I, I don't want a bunch of them feds showing up at, at my door. Oh, come on. Come on. It's time to get out of the closet and stand up and fight. If well, you're, uh, you're going to make us all do the fighting for you, then go back to bed. Oh, I do fax them. I, I just, I'm just so irate with an individual like that. that well, don't worry about them coming for you. Yeah. There, there's only one list, folks. All of you listen to me carefully. There's only one list. If you're not one of them, you're one of us. If you're one of us, you're already on the damn list. You understand? I'm going to go fax him right now. Good. Go do it. <laughs> and uh, it's up to you people out there to make sure these things don't happen in your town. In other words, whoever's in the town that that gentleman called from, make sure that they don't come and get him. Or you. Or anybody else. Unless it's done legally. And the person's really committed a crime. Good evening. You're on the air. Yes. I traded my drug and off for a 375. I would if I were you. That drug and off. I'll tell you what. You come after me with the drug and off, and I got my 375 after I get through making the improvements that you're going to hear about on Monday night. And uh, you're going to be uh, swinging with the angels, my friend. Understood. To add humor to your show, you can think up recipes to make uh, dog food recipes to, out of UN troops. 
Hey, that's a good idea. <laughs> Thank you. Goodbye. Not UN troops, but uh, anybody who comes to invade and occupy this country and take away our freedoms and our Constitution and our Bill of Rights, which really, they've already taken away the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. They've declared war upon us, folks. We have the law on our side. Good evening. You're on the air. Yes, Mr. Cooper. Uh, I was on last night, but uh, the reason I called is the fellow talked about uh, how can he handle the Vampire 2000. I'll tell you what we're doing here on the east part of the United States. I've gone to every police station in this part of Detroit, Michigan, Deer Detroit, Dearborn, southeast Michigan, and personally give them the packet, put it in their hands. Great. When I see a policeman, I give him a copy. I spend a lot of money, my own money, to get this truth out. Well, I think that's how you do it. You gotta have balls. Well, that's just what, do it. That's what I was trying to tell him. I think he'd have been doing that, but people have been handing it back to him. So, uh, <laughs> you know, when when that happens every single time, I mean, you just got to get out of there because you don't want to be the. Uh, uh, and, and I'm not trying to disparage Indians, but you, I'm an Indian, so I can say this. I'm an Indian. I can say that you don't want to be the only Indian in the middle of the fort. <laughs> well, I don't care. You know, I, I'm an American, and my goodness, guys worry about their names getting on a list. For crying out loud, you're on shortwave radio worldwide. Why should they worry? There's guys that are still in prison in, in uh, Russia, for crying out loud. I'll tell you why, because they want me to save them, and they think I'm going to save them, and they think they're not going to have to lift their hands, and I'm going to save them. And the truth is, is I'm probably going to get killed before the rest of you do, and I'll be happy when it's all over for me so I can go get some rest. <laughs> Well, but but I'll, I'll, I'll rest easily knowing that I did what was right. Absolutely, and I believe the same thing. I set my nose out in lots of places, and there's a lot of guys here doing the same things. Good. Yeah, there are. They're good people. America still, still has patriots around here, even in the East and the Midwest. Yeah, there are good people working all over this country to try to get ready, uh, and they will be working and... Uh, They'll be doing the right things, and they'll be there when the time comes. And we're out of time, folks. Carolyn, do you want to say anything before I we go? I wanted you to keep an eye on those 16, 17, 18, 19-year-olds. They're beginning to speak up, and they're terrific. That's right, except for the ones that are being misled and, uh, and are falling for this uh, Aryan supremacist bullshit and they're joining the skinheads. Uh, I'll tell you what, uh, they're, they're making a big mistake. Good night, folks, and God bless you.
Listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. And I'm Carolyn Nelson. And I'm Carolyn Nelson. Boy, oh boy. You're going to smack me good, aren't you? <laughs> Forgot to turn up your pot there. Okay, uh, folks, make sure you've got a big, thick pad of paper by your side and a pen. And get ready for the next of the series on treason. This is our number 11 of our treason series. And this one is going to open your eyes, and you're going to understand that uh, we've been screwed, blued, and tattooed for a long, long time, ladies and gentlemen. First, I want to uh, straighten out something that I may have said in error on the earlier show. I want to get that straight right now. Those of you who want to get this ultimate weapon that we're talking about that would help to repel an invasion and occupation of enemy forces who would want to take over the United States of America in defense of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. The proper weapon to get is a 375 H&H Magnum. 375 H&H Magnum, but it must have a Mauser action. It must have a Mauser action. I think I left that out in the earlier broadcast. And uh, if you don't have a Mauser action, you're going to have problems. Because what we're going to do is take that 375 H&H Magnum cartridge. And you're going to learn on Monday night uh, how to uh, create seven, uh, excuse me, 25%. Uh, more area inside that cartridge, which we're going to fill with powder. So, folks, <laughs> make sure you get a Mauser action. It's the only one strong enough to withstand this kind of a modification to a, a round that's already uh, one of the big game rounds of the world. So, uh, remember, you need a 375 h and H Magnum. It must have a Mauser action, and it has to have the longest barrel that you can find. Okay, make sure that you purchase it from someone who has a reputation for making accurate firearms. Everything that we're going to do is going to be 100% legal. So don't worry about it. Everything is legal. We don't advise you to do anything illegal on the hour of the time. Remember, the law is with us. We want the law to stay with us. I want to bring your attention now to a book that I want you to get. Make sure you get this book. This book was uh, published in 1939 and 1940 by H.G. Wells. 1939 and 1940 by H.G. Wells. Guess what the name of the book is, folks? 1939 and 1940 by H.G. Wells. The name of the book is... Ta -da, ta -da, the New World Order. That's right. The New World Order. Order, And I know that many of you out there thought that George Bush coined that phrase. Uh-uh. Here's what it says on the flyleaf of the dust jacket. What will happen to Europe and to the whole world when the present war is ended? There will be a revolution. That's obvious, Mr. Wells says. Following a consideration of those factors which make it inevitable, he concludes that such a revolution must be along socialistic lines if civilization is to survive. 
but the new world order, which Mr. Wells suggests must be a world socialism, scientifically planned and directed, with insistence upon law based on a restatement of the rights of man and complete freedom of speech, criticism, and publication. This can be attained, he is convinced, only if each one is equally certain that it can and each will work none now towards realizing it. And no sane man can make a better beginning in that direction than to read this book. The table of contents, ladies and gentlemen, chapter 1, is called The End of an Age. I bet you couldn't guess that after listening to my Mystery Babylon series. The End of an Age, which means it's the beginning of a new age. Remember, this was copyrighted in 1939 and 1940 by H.G. Wells before the war started. Before the war started. He says, what will happen to Europe and to the whole world when the present war is ended? Are you beginning to understand out there, sheeple? I hope so. Chapter 2, Open Conference. Chapter 3, Disruptive Forces. Chapter 4, Class War. Chapter 5, Unsated Youth. Bring anything to mind? Chapter 6, Socialism Unavoidable. Chapter 7, Federation. Chapter 8, The New Type of Revolution. Chapter 9, Politics for the Sane Man. Chapter 10, Declaration of the Rights of Man. Chapter 11, International Politics. Chapter 12, World Order in Being. Oh, uh, sometimes I wish they'd let me cuss on radio. <laughs> Oh, boy, I could just cuss a blue streak over some of this stuff. Isn't it fun, folks? Okay, don't go away. we got a lot of things to talk about. You've got a lot of numbers and report numbers and laws and executive orders and uh, U.S. codes and, and uh, congressional record references that you're going to need to write down because you're all going to have to go look this stuff up. And if you don't, if you don't, if you don't, then you'll never know whether I'm lying to you or not. And if you just go with it without checking it out, that means you cease to be their puppet on their string, and now you're my puppet on my string. Everybody write down Senate Report Number 93-549, 93rd Congress, First Session, 1973. That's Senate Report Number 93-549, 93rd Congress, First Session, 1973. I'm going to say it one more time. Senate Report Number 93-549, 93rd Congress, First Session, 1973. The title is Summary of Emergency Power Statutes. It's the Summary of Emergency Power Statutes. It consists of 607 pages, ladies and gentlemen, which I think you will find most interesting. You see, the United States went bankrupt in 1933 and was declared so, was declared so, 
by President Roosevelt, by Executive Orders Number 6073, 6102, 6111, and by Executive Order 6260 on March the 9th, 1933. The Executive Order 6073, 6102, 6111, and by Executive Order 6260 on March 9th, 1933. Also see Senate Report 93-549, pages 187 and 594. Under the Trading with the Enemy Act. That's the Trading with the Enemy Act. Okay, 65th Congress. That's Trading with the Enemy Act, 65th Congress, Session 1, Chapters 105 and 106, October 6, 1917. So Trading with the Enemy Act, 65th Congress, Session 1, Chapters 105 and 106, October 6, 1917, and as codified at 12 U.S.C.A. 95A, that's 12 U.S.C.A. 95A, on May 23, 1933. Congressman Lewis T. McFadden brought formal charges against the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve Bank System, the Comptroller of the Currency, and the Secretary of the United States Treasury for criminal acts. The petition for articles of impeachment was thereafter referred to the Judiciary Committee and has yet to be acted upon, and the traitors in Congress know about it and are sitting on it and have been sitting on it from that date until this. See the Congressional Record, pages 4055 and 4058. Congress confirmed the bankruptcy on June the 5th, 1933, and impaired the obligations and considerations of contracts through the joint resolution to suspend the gold standard and abrogate the gold clause, June 5, 1933. See House Joint Resolution 192, 73rd Congress, first session. The several states of the Union pledged the faith and credit thereof to the aid of the national government and formed numerous socialist committees such as the Council of State Governments, Social Security Administration, and many others. And these were to purportedly deal with the economic emergency. These organizations operated, ladies and gentlemen, on something that you thought just came about, but that's not true, operated under the Declaration of Interdependence. The Declaration of Interdependence. Hmm. <laughs> of January the 22nd, 1937, and published some of their activities in the Book of the States. The 1937 edition of the Book of the States openly declared that the people engaged in such activities as the farming husbandry industry had been reduced to mere feudal tenants on their land. Refer to the Book of the States, 1937, page 155. This, of course, was compounded by such activities as price fixing, wheat and grains, 7 U.S.C.A. 19, or excuse me, 7 U.S.C.A. 1332, quota regulations, 7 U.S.C.A. 1371, and livestock products, 7 U.S.C.A. 1903, which have been consistently below the cost of production. Interest on loans and inflation of the paper bills of credit, leaving the food producers and others in a state of peonage and involuntary servitude, constituting the taking of private property for the benefit and use of others without just compensation against the Constitution. Now, the Council of State Governments has now been absorbed into such things as the National Conference of Commissioners on Uniform State Laws, whose headquarters office is located at 676 North Street. Oh, excuse me. That's wrong, folks. It's 676 North St. Clair Street, Suite 1700, Chicago, Illinois, 
676-0611. That's 676 North St. Clair Street, Suite 1700, Chicago, Illinois, 60611. And all, being members of the bar and operating under a different constitution and bylaws, far distant from the depositories of the public records, has promulgated, lobbied for, passed, adjudicated, and ordered the implementation and execution of their purported uniform and model acts and pretended statutory provisions to help implement international treaties of the United States are where world uniformity would be desirable. See the 1990 and 1991 reference book, National Council of Commissioners on Uniform State Laws, page 2. This is apparently what Robert Bork meant when he wrote, quote, We are governed not by law or elected representatives, but by an unelected, unrepresentative, unaccountable committee of lawyers applying no will but their own, unquote. All, all, ladies and gentlemen, Freemasons. See The Tempting of America by Robert H. Bork, page 130. This association has been engaged in activities such as turning marriage licenses into international private law through its international liaisons, which meet at such places as the Hague Conferences. See the Handbook of Commissioners on Uniform State Laws, 1966 edition, pages 156 and 157. On April 25, 1938, the Supreme Court overturned this standing precedence of the prior 150 years concerning common law in the federal government and said this, quote, There is no federal common law, and Congress has no power to declare substantive rules of common law applicable in a state, whether they be local or general in their nature, be they commercial law or a part of the law of torts, unquote. See the case, Erie Railroad Company versus Tompkins, 304, United States, 64, 80, uh, 82nd uh, L.Ed, 1188. The common law is the fountain source of substantive and remedial rights, if not our very liberties. For that, see Stephen A., Treaties on the Principles of Pleading, Stephen A., Treaties, on the Principles of Pleading, Introduction, page 23, and Hemingway, History of Common Law Pleading as Evidence of the Growth of Individual Liberty and Power of the Courts, 5 Alabama Law Journal, 1 Swift v. Tyson, 16 Peters 1, 10 L. Ed. 865, The Constitution, Article 3, Section 2, and Amendments 7, 9, and 10. You want some more homework? <laughs> Told you, folks. This is treason, and it's all documented, and anybody can find it. The members and association of the bar thereafter formed committees, granted themselves special privileges, immunities, and franchises, and held meetings concerning the judicial procedures, and further, to amend laws to conform to a trend of judicial decisions are to accomplish similar objectives, including hodgepodging the jurisdictions of law and equity together, which is known today as one form of action. See the Constitution and Bylaws, Article 3, Section 3.3C, 1990-91, Reference Book, Supra. See also Colorado Methods of Practice, or Western Publications, Volume 4, or West Publications, Volume 4, pages 2 and 3, for the author's comments. The enumerated, specific, and distinct jurisdictions established by the ordained Constitution in 1789, Article 3, Section 2, and under the Bill of Rights, 1791, Amendment 7, were further hodgepodged and fundamentally changed in 1982 to include admiralty jurisdiction, which was once again brought inland. Quote, this is the fundamental change necessary to effect unification of civil and admiralty procedure, just as the 1938 rules abolished the distinction between actions at law and suits in equity. This change would abolish the distinction between civil actions and suits in admiralty. Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, 1982 edition, page 17. Also see the Federalist Papers, number 83. 
The Declaration of Resolves of the First Continental Congress, October 14, 1774. The Declaration of Cause and Necessity of Taking Up Arms, July 6, 1775. The Declaration of Independence, July 4, 1776. Bennett versus Butterworth, 52, United States, 669. Well, maybe you better go get a glass of water. <laughs> I need a drink of coffee, so... <clears throat> Start feeling that little tickle in the back of my throat. Well, whatever that is that uh, we all have, it just seems to hang on. The United States, folks, thereafter entered the Second World War, during which time the League of Nations was reinstituted under pretense of the United Nations. Remember, it had already risen and died. Now it was resurrected under the pretense of the United Nations. For that, see 22 USCA 287 at Sequitur and the Bank for International Settlements, reinstituted under pretense of the Bretton Woods Agreement. See 60 Statutes 1401 22 USCA 286 at Sequitur as the International Monetary Fund. The Fund and the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development the bank. So do you now have the fund and the bank. The United States, as a corporate body politic, artificial, came out of World War II in worse economic shape than when it entered, and in 1950 declared bankruptcy and reorganization. The reorganization is located in Title V of United States Codes Annotated. The explanation at the beginning of 5 U.S.C.A. is most informative reading. The Secretary of the Treasury was appointed as the receiver in bankruptcy. See Reorganization Plan No. 26, 5 U.S.C.A. 903, Public Law 94-564. Legislative History, pages 5967. The United States went down the road and periodically filled or filed for further reorganization. Things and situations worsened, having done what they were commanded not to do. For that, see Madison's Notes, Constitutional Convention, August 16, 1787, and Federalist Papers, number 44, and in 1965 passed the Coinage Act of 1965, completely debasing the constitutional coin, gold and silver, in effect dollar, C-18 U.S.C.A. 331 and 332, U.S. v. Marigold, 50 U.S., 560, 13 L. Ed. 257, at the signing of the Coinage Act on July 23, 1965, Lyndon Baines Johnson stated in his press release that, quote, When I have signed this bill before me, we will have made the first fundamental change in our coinage in 173 years. The Coinage Act of 1965 supersedes the Act of 1792, and that act had the title, An Act Establishing a Mint and Regulating the Coinage of the United States. Now I will sign this bill to make the first change in our coinage system since the 18th century. To those members of Congress who are here on this historic occasion, I want to assure you that in making this change from the 18th century, we have no idea of returning to it." Unquote. Now it's important, folks, to take cognizance of the fact that no constitutional amendment was ever obtained to fundamentally change, amend, abridge, or abolish the constitutional mandates, provisions, or prohibitions. But due to internal and external diversions surrounding the Vietnam War, etc., the usurpation and breach went basically unchallenged and unnoticed by the general public at large. 
who became a wealthy man's cannon fodder, our cheap source of slave labor. Let me say that for you again. The usurpation and breach went basically unchallenged and unnoticed by the general public at large. That's you. Who became a wealthy man's cannon fodder or cheap source of slave labor. That's you again. See Silent Weapons for Quiet Wars, Chapter 1, Behold a Pale Horse, by William Cooper. Congress was clearly delegated the power and authority to regulate and maintain the true and inherent value of the coin within the scope and purview of Article 1, Section 8, Clauses 5 and 6, and Article 1, Section 10, Clause 1 of the Ordained Constitution of 1787, and further, under a corresponding duty and obligation to maintain said gold and silver coin and foreign coin at and within the Necessary and Proper Equal Weights and Measures Clause. See also the Bible, Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 13 through 16, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 11, and Public Law 97-289 and 96 Statutes 1211. Those exercising the offices of the several states in equal measure knew such de facto transitions were unlawful and unauthorized, unconstitutional, but sanctioned, implemented, and enforced the complete debauchment and the resulting governmental, social, industrial, economic change in the de jure states and in the United States of America. See Public Law 94-564, Legislative History. Page 5936 and 5945, 31 U.S.C.A. 314, 31 U.S.C.A. 321, 31 U.S.C.A. 5112, C.R.S. 1161-101, C.R.S. 3922-103.5, and C.R.S. 1811-203, and were and are now under the delusion that they can do both directly and indirectly what they were absolutely prohibited from doing. See also the Federalist Papers, number 44, Craig v. Missouri, and 4 Peters, 903. In 1966, ladies and gentlemen, Congress began severely compromised, passed the Federal Tax Lien Act of 1966, by which the entire taxing and monetary system, in effect, the essential engine, see the Federalist Papers, number 31, and Silent Weapons for Quiet Wars, Behold a Pale Horse, Chapter 1, and uh, was placed under the Uniform Commercial Code. See Public Law 89-719. Legislative History, pages 37-22. Also, see CRS 51106. The Uniform Commercial Code was, of course, promulgated by the National Conference of Commissioners on Uniform State Laws in collusion with American Law Institute for the, quote, banking and business interests, unquote. See the handbook of the National Conference of Commissioners on Uniform State Laws, 1966 edition, pages 152 and 153. The United States, being engaged in numerous United Nations conflicts, including the Korean and the Vietnam conflicts, which were under direction of the United Nations, see 22 USCA 287D, and agreeing to foot the bill, C-22 U.S.C.A. 287-J, and not being able to honor their obligations and rehypothecated debt credit openly and publicly dishonored and disavowed their notes and obligations. 12 U.S.C.A. 411, in effect, Federal Reserve Notes through Public Law 90-269, Section 2, 82 Statutes at Large, 50, 1968, to wit. Quote, Section 2. The first sentence of Section 15 of the Federal Reserve Act, 12 U.S.C. 391, is amended by striking, quote, and the funds provided in this act for the redemption of Federal Reserve notes, unquote. Things steadily grew worse. 
And on March 28, 1970, President Nixon issued Proclamation No. 3972, declaring an emergency because the postal employees struck against the de facto government for higher pay due to inflation of the paper bills of credit. See Senate Report No. 93-549, page 596. Nixon then placed the United States Postal Department under control of the Department of Defense. C. The Department of the Army Field Manual, FM 41-10, 1969 edition. The system had been faltering for a decade, but the benchmark date of the collapse is put at August 15, 1971. On this day, President Nixon reversed United States international monetary policy by officially declaring the non-convertibility of the United States dollar, or Federal Reserve note, into gold. See Public Law 94-564, Legislative History, page 5937, and Senate Report number 93-549. Forward on page 3. <coughs> my tongue is getting tied around my eye tooth, folks. Let me say that again so that no one gets confused. See Public Law 94-564. Legislative History, page 5937, and Senate Report, number 93-549, forward, page 3, Proclamation, number 4074, page 597, 31 U.S.C.A. 314, and 31 U.S.C.A. 5112. On September 21st, 1973, Congress passed Public Law 93-1. This one-hour commercial for Swiss America Trading is brought to you by the United States de facto counterfeit government sitting in Washington, D.C., populated by traders. For the quickest way out, call Swiss America Trading at 1-800-289-2646. That's 1-800-289-2646. Do it now, folks. If everybody in this country would it just convert their worthless Federal Reserve notes into gold or silver coin and use nothing less than gold or silver coin and accept nothing less than gold or silver coin. All the traitors and the treason and the New World Order would be rendered bankrupt, ineffective, and it would be all over. But of course, of course, we know that nobody's going to do that. Except the smart ones. Call now. 1-800-289-2646. That's 1-800-289-2646. Thank them for sponsoring this program. You'll be glad that you did.
Law 94-564, Legislative History, page 5937. And Senate Report number 93-549, forward, page 3, Proclamation number 4074, page 597, 31 U.S.C.A. 314 and 31 U.S.C.A. 5112. On September 21, 1973, Congress passed Public Law 93-110, amending the Bretton Woods Par Value Modification Act, 82 Statutes 116, 31 U.S.C.A. 449, and reiterated the emergency under 12 U.S.C.A. 95A and Section 8 of the Bretton Woods Agreements Act of 1945, 22 U.S.C.A. 286F, and which included reports on foreign currency transactions. See also Executive Order Number 10033. This act further declared in Section 2B that, quote, no provision of any law, in effect, on the date of enactment of this act, and no rule, regulation, or order under authority of any such law may be construed to prohibit any person from purchasing, holding, selling, or otherwise dealing with gold. On January 19, 1976, Marjorie S. Holt noted for the record a second declaration of interdependence and clearly identified the United Nations as a communist organization and that they were seeking both production and monetary control over the Union and people through international organization promoting the One World Order. See Congressional Record, January 19, 1976, Extension of Remarks. Also see 8 U.S.C.A. 1101, 40, 50 U.S.C.A. 781, and 783. The socio-economic situation, of course, worsened, as noted <coughs> in the complaint petition filed in the U.S. Court of Claims, docket number 41-76, on February the 11th, 1976, by 44 federal judges, Atkins et al. versus United States. Atkins et al. complained that, quote, as a result of inflation, the compensation of federal judges has been substantially diminished each year since 1969, causing direct and continuing monetary harm to plaintiffs. The real value of the dollar decreased by approximately 34.5% from March 15, 1969 to October 1, 1975. As a result, plaintiffs have suffered an unconstitutional deprivation of earnings, unquote. And then the prayer for relief claimed, quote, damages for the constitutional violations enumerated above measured as the diminution of his earnings for the entire period since March 9, 1969, unquote. Now, <laughs> you don't have to be too smart to know that it's quite apparent that the persons holding and enjoying offices of public trust and honor and our prophet knew of the emergency emergent problem and sought protection for themselves to the damage and injury of the people and children who were classified as a, quote, club that has many other members, unquote, and, quote, have no remedy, unquote, and knowing that, quote, heinous, unquote, acts had been committed, stated that they, judges and lawyers, would not apply the law, nor would any substantive remedy be applied, or checked more or less, but never stopped, quote, until all of us judges are dead, unquote, such persons fraudulently swore an oath to uphold, defend, and preserve the sovereignty of the nation and several Republican states of the Union and breached the duty to protect the people, the citizens, and their posterity from fraud, imposition, avarice, and stealthy encroachment. See Atkins et al. versus United States, 556 F2D. 1028, page 1072, 1074. See The Tempting of America, Supra, pages 155 through 159. Also see 5 U.S.C.A. 5305 and 5335. 
Senate Report Number 93-549, pages 69 through 71. CRS 2475-101. This is verified in Public Law 94-564. The Legislative History, page 5944, which states, Quote, Moving to a floating exchange rate for international commerce means private enterprise and not central governments bear the risk of currency fluctuations. Unquote. That's us. Now, numerous serious debates were held in Congress, including but not limited to Tuesday, July 27, 1976. And you can see the congressional record for the House, July 27, 1976 concerning the international financial institutions and its operations. Representative Ron Paul, chairman of the House Banking Committee, made numerous references to the true practices of the, quote, international, unquote, financial institutions, including, but not limited to, the conversion of $27 million in gold contributed by the United States as part of its quota obligations, which the International Monetary Fund, Governor, Secretary of the Treasury. Now, you know what I'm saying here. The Governor of the International Monetary Fund is the Secretary of the Treasury of the United States of America. He receives his paycheck from the International Monetary Fund and not from the United States government. Talk about treason. The International Monetary Fund sold this gold. They sold it. See Public Law 94-564. The legislative history is on pages 59-45 and 59-46. And they sold it under some very questionable terms and concessions. You can also see the Ron Paul Money Book, 1991 by Ron Paul, Plantation Publishing, 837 West Plantation, Clute, Texas, 77531. That last number was the zip code, in case you're still enmeshed in all these USCAs and uh, other things. On October 28, 1977, the passage of Public Law 95-147, 91 statutes, 1227, declared most banking institutions, including state banks, to be under direction and control of the corporate governor of the International Monetary Fund. See Public Law 94-564. And let me read that again for you. On October 28, 1977, the passage of Public Law 95-147, 91 statutes, 1227, declared most banking institutions, including state banks, to be under direction and control of the corporate governor of the International Monetary Fund. See Public Law 94-564, Legislative History, page 5942, United States Government Manual, 1990 and 91, pages 480 through 481, and the Act further declared that, quote, Two, Section 10A of the Gold Reserve Act of 1934, 31 U.S.C. 822A and B, is amended by striking out the phrase, quote, stabilizing the exchange value of the dollar, unquote, unquote. C, the joint resolution entitled Joint Resolution to Assure Uniform Value to the Coins and Currencies of the United States, approved June 5, 1933, 31 U.S.C. 463, shall not apply to obligations issued on or after the date of enactment of this section, unquote. The international organizations, corporations, and associations had refused to pay their debts and could not pay their debts, and determined that they could pass the loss of their non-redeemable, non-current notes, bonds, and evidences of debt off on others, and thereby crown their fraud with success. wonder who those others are. Are. You're going to find out. See a letter, October 26, 1989, from the Department of Treasury, Russell L. Monk, Assistant General Counsel, International Affairs, as recorded in the office of the Clerk and Recorder, Baca County, Colorado, at Book 540, page 364. 
the de facto United States as corporator. 22 USCA 286E at sequitur and state. CRS 2436-104. CRS 2460-1301. Article 4H. Had declared, quote, insolvency, unquote. C 26 IRC 165G 1. UCC 1 201 23. CRS 3922103.5 Westfall versus Braley 10 Ohio 18875 <coughs> MDEC 509 Adams versus Richardson 337 SW2nd or 2D I should say SW2D 911 Ward versus Smith 7 Wall 447 In 1980 Congress passed, among other things, Public Law 96-221, providing for the furtherance and expansion of the profligate rehypothecated debt pyramid scheme and reduced the reserve requirements on transaction accounts to a minimum of 3% per centum to a maximum of 14% per centum. See Depository Institutions Deregulation and Monetary Control Act of 1980. Section 103 B.E. 2. Quote, In the United States, neither paper currency nor deposits have value as commodities. Intrinsically, a dollar bill is just a piece of paper. Deposits are merely book entries. Coins do have some intrinsic value as metal, but generally far less than their face amount. In the absence of legal reserve requirements, Banks can build up deposits by increasing loans and investments so long as they keep enough currency on hand to redeem whatever amounts the holders of deposits want to convert into currency. This unique attribute of the banking business was discovered several centuries ago. At one time, bankers were merely middlemen. They made profit by accepting gold and coins brought to them for safekeeping and lending them to borrowers but they soon found that the receipts they issued to depositors were being used as money, since whoever held them could go to the banker and exchange them for metallic money. Then, bankers discovered that they could make loans merely by giving borrowers their promise to pay banknotes. That's what banknotes are, folks. In this way, banks began to create money. More notes could be issued than the gold and coin on hand because only a portion of the notes outstanding would be presented for payment at any one time. Enough metallic money had to be kept on hand, of course, to redeem whatever volume of notes was presented for payment. Transaction deposits are the modern counterpart of bank notes. It was a small step from printing notes to making book entries to the credit of borrowers, which the borrowers in turn could spend by writing checks thereby printing their own money. See Modern Money Mechanics, a workbook on deposits, currency, and bank reserves, 1982. Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, Post Office Box 834, Chicago, Illinois, 60690, pages 3 and 4. What I just read, you ladies and gentlemen, is quoted verbatim from the Depository Institutions Deregulation and Monetary Control Act of 1980, Section 103BE2. Fifty-nine years is not temporary. It's a permanent state of emergency and was clearly instituted, formed, and erected within the Union through gross usurpations, abridgments, malfeasance, breach of legal duties, treason, and the continual contrivance, misrepresentation, conversion, fluctuations, fraud, lies, and avarice of the international financial institutions, organizations, corporations, and associations, and secret societies, including the Federal Reserve, their fiscal and depository agent, 22 USCA 286D. This Profligate practice has led to such emergency legislation as the Public Debt Limit Balance Budget and Emergency Deficit Control Act of 1985, Public Law 99-177, etc. 
the government by becoming a corporator, C-22 U.S.C.A. 286E, lays down its sovereignty and takes on that of a private citizen. It can exercise no power which is not derived from the corporate charter. See the Bank of the United States versus Planters Bank of Georgia. 6 L. Ed. 9 Wheat. 244. United States versus Burr. 309 U.S. 242. The real party in interest is not the de jure United States of America or state, but, quote, the bank, unquote, and, quote, the fund, unquote. 22 U.S.C.A. 286 at Secular, C.R.S. 1160-103. The acts committed under fraud, force, and seizures are many times done under, quote, Letters of marquee and reprisal, unquote, in effect, recapture under the prize laws of admiralty. C-31 U.S.C.A. 5323, such principles as fraud and justice never, ever dwell, ladies and gentlemen, together. Wingate's Maxims 680, and, quote, a right of action cannot arise out of fraud, unquote. Broom's Maxims 297 and 729. Cowper's Reports 343. Five Scott's New Reports 558. Ten Massachusetts 276, 38 Fed 800 are too high of a thought concept, as is due process. Just compensation and justice itself. You see, honor is earned by honesty and integrity, not under false and fraudulent pretenses, nor will the color of the cloth one wears cover up the usurpations, lies, trickery, deceits, and treason. You see, when black is fraudulently declared to be white, not all will live in darkness. As astutely observed by Will Rogers, quote, there are men running governments who shouldn't be allowed to play with matches, unquote, and we learned that in Waco, Texas. And it is as applicable today as Jesus' statements about lawyers. The contrived emergency has created numerous abuses and usurpations and abridgments of delegated powers and authority as stated in Senate Report 93-549. Quote, Since March 9, 1933, the United States has been in a state of declared national emergency. In fact, there are now in effect four presidentially proclaimed states of national emergency, in addition to the national emergency declared by President Roosevelt in 1933. There are also the national emergency proclaimed by President Truman on December 26th, or excuse me, December 16th, 1950. That's December 16th, 1950, during the Korean conflict. And the states of national emergency declared by President Nixon on March 23rd, 1970, and August 15th, 1971. These proclamations give force to 470 provisions of federal law. These hundreds of statutes delegate to the President extraordinary powers, ordinarily exercised by the Congress, which affect the lives of American citizens in a host of all-encompassing manners. This vast range of powers taken together confer enough authority to rule the country without reference to constitutional process. Under the powers delegated by these statutes, the President may seize property, Organize and control the means of production. Seize commodities. Assign military forces abroad. Institute martial law. Seize and control all transportation and communication. Regulate the operation of private enterprise. Restrict travel. And in a plethora of particular ways, control the lives of every American citizen. The introduction of that Senate report on page one, begins with a phenomenal declaration to wit, quote, 
a majority of the people of the United States have lived all of their lives under emergency rule. For 40 years, freedoms and governmental procedures guaranteed by the Constitution have in varying degrees been abridged by laws brought into force by states of national emergency. Unquote. Good night, and God bless you all. This is the only hour that ever was or ever will be. This is the most important hour in your entire life. For during this hour you will decide your future, and thus our collective futures. You're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. And I'm Carolyn Nelson. Last night, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and as I was uh, telling you, 
about the 375 H&H Magnum rifle that we are going to be talking about on Monday. I think I failed to mention that it must have a Mauser action. The Mauser action is the only one strong enough to withstand the modifications that we're going to do to the round that you're going to be firing through this weapon. So I wanted to straighten that out right off the bat tonight. It's got to have a Mauser action. 375 H&H &H Magnum with a Mauser action should have the longest, uh, uh, best barrel that you can uh, purchase. And uh, stay tuned for Monday night, and we'll tell you exactly what to do with it. Don't go away. is produced and directed by Pooh, who's here in the studio with us, overseeing everything. And, of course, singing right along with the lyrics. She's my brown-eyed girl. Yes, sir. Tonight, 83rd Congress, second session. United States Senate, document number 87. 83rd Congress, second session. United States Senate Document Number 87, a review of the United Nations Charter, a collection of documents, subcommittee of the United Nations Charter, pursuant to Senate Resolution 126, 83rd Congress, First Session, presented by Mr. Wiley, January 7, 1954, ordered to be printed with illustrations, United States Government Printing Office, Washington, 1954. I'll be reading selected excerpts. And we're going to start off here with Section 36, Act Prescribing the Position of the United States Flag to the United States. Let me start that over again, folks. Act Prescribing the Position of the United Nations Flag to the United States Flag, July 9, 1953. An Act. To prohibit the display of flags of international organizations or other nations in equal or superior prominence or honor to the flag of the United States, and catch this, folks, except under specified circumstances and for other purposes. Be it enacted by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled that Section 3C of the Joint Resolution entitled Joint Resolution to Codify and Emphasize Existing Rules and Customs Pertaining to the Display and Use of the Flag of the United States of America, approved June 22, 1942, as amended 36 United States Code Section 175C, is amended by adding at the end thereof the following new sentence, quote, No person 
shall display the flag of the United Nations or any other national or international flag equal above or in a position of superior prominence or honor to or in place of the flag of the United States at any place within the United States or any territory or possession thereof provided that nothing in this section shall make unlawful the continuance of the practice heretofore followed of displaying the flag of the United Nations in a position of superior prominence or honor and other national flags in positions of equal prominence or honor with that of the flag of the United States at the headquarters of the United Nations, approved July 9, 1953. Treaties and Domestic Law View of the four sponsoring... Oh, I want to want to make a point on that, folks, that the United Nations flag is flown at the United Nations headquarters above the flag of the United States, and it is United States soil. Treaties and domestic law. View of the four sponsoring governments. Abstract of statement by Honorable John Foster Dulles, United States Delegation on Domestic Jurisdiction, Clause of the Charter, San Francisco Conference, 1945. In his exposition of the intent of Article 8, Mr. Dulles emphasized that the four-power amendment dealt with domestic jurisdiction as a basic principle, and not has been the case, in the original Dumbarton Oaks proposals and in Article 15 of the Covenant of the League of Nations, as a technical and legalistic formula designed to deal with the settlement of disputes by the Security Council. This change in concept had been caused, he explained, by the change in the character of the organization as planned in the discussions at San Francisco. The scope of the organization was now broadened to include functions which would enable the organization to eradicate the underlying causes of war, as well as to deal with crises leading to war. Under the Social and Economic Council, the organization would deal with economic and social problems. This broadening of the scope of the organization constituted a great advance, but it also engendered special problems. For instance, the question had been raised as to what would be the basic relation of the organization to member states. Would the organization deal with the governments of the member states, or would the organization penetrate directly into the domestic life and social economy of the member states? As provided in the amendment of the sponsoring governments, Mr. Dulles pointed out that this principle would require the organization to deal with the governments. Under the Economic and Social Council, the organization had a mandate to raise the standards of living and foster employment, etc., but no one in the ten-member council would go behind the governments in order to impose its desires. The amendment recognized the distinct value of the individual social life of each state. In reply to the contention that domestic jurisdiction should be determined in accordance with international law, Mr. Dulles again pointed out that international law was subject to constant change and therefore escaped definition. It would, in any case, be difficult to define whether or not a given situation came within the domestic jurisdiction of a state. Interesting. In summary, Mr. Dulles stressed the virtues of the principle, its breadth, and its simplicity. The organization, in none of its branches or organs, should intervene in what was essentially the domestic life of the member states. Moreover, this principle was subject to evolution. In other words, what he just said didn't mean anything. <laughs> the United States had had long experience in dealing with a parallel problem. In effect, the relationship between the 48 states and the federal government. Today, the federal government of the United States exercised an authority undreamed of when the Constitution was formed and the people of the United States were grateful for the simple conceptions contained in their Constitution. And we still are, folks. We'd like to have it back. In like manner, Mr. Dulles foresaw that if the Charter contained simple and broad principles, future generations would be thankful to the men at San Francisco who had drafted it. Thank you very much, Mr. Alger Hiss, you commie devil, you, you, you rat, you dirty, dirty rat, and all the rest of you. Oh, uh, boy, all but one of those who had a hand in drafting the United Nations Charter, ladies and gentlemen, were eventually named as communists, and many of them were imprisoned. 
The chairman moved a vote of thanks to Mr. Dulles for his masterly exposition of the prob problem of domestic jurisdiction, and Mr. Evett rose to second the motion. <clears throat> now we go to uh, section 69. Say Fujii and the State of California. Opinion of the District Court of Appeals, 2nd District, Division 2, California, April 24, 1950. In the period of 30 years since the Alien Land Law was adopted, we have revised our opinions concerning the rights of other peoples out of the travail of World War II came the concept of respect for human rights and for fundamental freedoms for all without distinction as to race, sex, language, or religion, as expressed in the Charter of the United Nations, 59 Statutes, 1035 FF, U.S. Code, Congressional Service, 79th Congress, 1945, page 964. The government of the United States has traditionally been the leader in espousing the rights of man and has championed the cause of the smaller and less privileged nations. The War of 1898 was fought in support of an oppressed country. The efforts of our government in this regard reached fruition in the Convention of Representatives of the Nations of the Earth at which the Charter of the United Nations was adopted. It was promptly ratified by the Senate of the United States, thereby proclaiming allegiance to its principles and providing precedent and example for other countries. The United States has consistently regarded its treaties with other nations as inviolate. The Charter has become, quote, the supreme law of the land, and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary, notwithstanding, unquote. Now, for all you sheeple out there who don't understand what I just read, I'm going to read it again, and all you bleeding liberals out there who claim allegiance to the Constitution but support this treason, you better listen very closely. You cannot have two masters. The charter has become, quote, the supreme law of the land, and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary, notwithstanding, unquote. United States Constitution, Article 6, Section 2, the position of this country and the family of nations forbids trafficking in, in Notious generalities, but demands that every state in the Union accept and act upon the Charter according to its plain language and its unmistakable purpose and intent. And there you have it, folks. An admission by the United States Senate that the United Nations Charter is the supreme law of the land. Now, those of you who have been so obnoxious as to call me a liar, I expect to have a written apology within five days. Thank you very much. Since the Charter is now the supreme law of the land, it becomes necessary to examine its provisions and guarantees and to interpret it in the light in which it was adopted by the participating nations. The organization determined in the preamble, quote, to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights and the dignity and worth of the human person, to promote social progress and better standards of life in larger freedom. There is no larger freedom, ladies and gentlemen, than what we have possessed in this country. What they are talking about is democratic socialism. In other words what the Nazis had in Germany in World War II. Social progress and better standards of life in larger freedom. Once you understand the socialist code words, it begins to make better sense to you. Remember, socialism and socialists suck. Can't put it any better than that. They're all out there somewhere sucking right this moment. Among the purposes and principles found in Article 1 of Chapter 1 are, quote, to develop friendly relations among nations based on respect for the principle of equal rights. 
to achieve international cooperation in promoting and encouraging respect for human rights and for fundamental freedoms for all without distinction as to race, sex, language, or religion, unquote. Now notice what they say, folks. Our forefathers said all men are created equal. Created equal. That means when they're born, they have the same opportunities as anyone else. What they do with their life, however, is quite a different story. In other words, when all of a generation reach the age of 20 years old, they are not equal. Some have demonstrated that they are superior, some remain average, and some become a burden upon everyone else and are, without a doubt, inferior. But socialists, socialists, say this. Socialist folks say this, listen carefully, to develop friendly relations among nations based on respect for the principle of equal rights, which means everyone is equal all the time. It just ain't so, ladies and gentlemen. Never has been and never will be. No one, no one will ever have any respect for the person who makes welfare a career, who has children just for the sake of more money in their welfare check. No one will ever have any respect for a man, a man, who sits on the street corner claiming that there are no jobs when you can open any newspaper and find pages and pages of jobs available for those who would have them. For people who, when they need work, will not accept the work that may be available until they can find better work because, quote, it's beneath my dignity, unquote. <laughs> if you're that kind of person, you have no dignity. You have no honor, no ethics. In Article 2, it is affirmed that the organization and its members, quote, shall fulfill in good faith the obligations assumed by them in accordance with the pres present charter, unquote. It is agreed in Chapter 9, Article 55, that the United Nations shall promote universal respect for and observance of human rights and fundamental freedoms for all without distinction as to race, sex, language, or religion. By Article 56, it is declared that all members pledge themselves to take joint and separate action in cooperation with the organization for the achievement of the purposes set forth in Article 55. In the address of the President of the United States to the Senate on July 2, 1945, urging the prompt ratification of the Charter by that body, he said, quote, It seeks to promote worldwide progress and better standards of living. It seeks to achieve universal respect for and observance of human rights and fundamental freedoms for all men and women without distinction as to race, language, or religion. It seeks to remove the economic and social causes of international conflict and unrest. It is the product of many hands and many influences. It comes from the reality of experience in a world where one generation has failed twice to keep the peace. The lessons of that experience have been written into the document Unquote. United States Code, Congressional Service, Supra, pages 961 through 962. They don't tell you that they're the ones who caused those wars in order to bring this about. And that is well documented also. On December 10, 1948, the General Assembly of the United Nations passed and proclaimed and called upon all member countries to publicize, disseminate, and expound in schools and elsewhere a, quote, universal declaration of human rights, unquote. And you all thought it was something new, didn't you? None of this is new, folks. None of it. Affirming, among other things, that, quote, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They should act toward one another in a spirit of brotherhood. I agree with that, folks as long as it stops with being born free and equal in dignity and rights. Many people give up their freedom voluntarily 
and no one beyond that point is equal in the truest sense with anyone else. Your station in life is determined by your production, your contributions to society, your ethics, and your morals. Not just because you exist. Not just because you occupy space and suck in air and blow out air. That means only that you are here and nothing else. Act 1, Article 1. <laughs> should be Act 1. Article 1. Everyone is entitled to all the rights and freedoms set forth in this declaration without distinction of any kind, such as race, color, sex, language, religion, political, or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth, or other status. I agree with that. Article 2. Everyone has the right to own property alone as well as in association with others. I also agree with that. In fact, the ownership of property is an absolute requirement of a free people. You will find, though, that in the resolutions passed and pending, and in the many charters that the United Nations has promulgated, the right to own property is questionable at best in this totalitarian socialist order. And you can see that they are attempting huge land grabs with the excuse of environmental action. Recently, the United States Congress passed a law, and Clinton signed that law, stating that environmental inspectors have access to all personal property to inspect to see if you're endangering the green polka-dotted earthworm or some other such nonsense. So if they come to your door, you are forbidden by law to bar them entry. However, we all know it's unconstitutional, but as I've just demonstrated to you, the Constitution is not in force. The Constitution has been superseded by the United Nations Charter, by the Senate's own admission in this document. Article 17. This declaration implements and emphasizes the purpose and aims of the United Nations and its charter. Democracy provides a way of life that is helpful. However, its promise, promises of human betterment are but vain expressions of hope unless ideals of justice and equity are put into practice among governments, and as well between government and citizen, and are held to be paramount. Now, what's wrong with this statement, folks, is we do not and have never lived in a democracy. This is a republic, and if you do not know the difference, you'd better find out now. All this talk of democracy is but a code word for the creeping, all-encompassing socialism that will engulf us, swallow us whole, digest us, and secrete us as waste material and the progress of the coming to power of the all-powerful state. People don't matter in socialist governments. Only the state matters. And if you're a people, you better get concerned about that. Real quick. The integrity and validity, or vitality, the integrity and vitality of the Charter and the confidence which it inspires would wane and eventually be brought to naught by failure to act according to its announced purposes. Its survival is contingent upon the degree of reverence shown for it by the contracting nations, their governmental subdivisions, and their citizens as well. This nation can be true to its pledge to the other signatories to the Charter only by cooperating in the purposes that are so plainly expressed in it and by removing every obstacle to the fulfillment of such purposes. 
A perusal of the Charter renders it manifest that restrictions contained in the Alien Land Law are in direct conflict with the plain terms of the Charter above quoted and with the purposes announced therein by its framers. It is incompatible with Article 17 of the Declaration of Human Rights, which proclaims the right of everyone to own property. We have shown that the expansion by the Congress of the classes of nationals eligible to citizenship has correspondingly shrunk the group ineligible under the provisions of the Alien Land Law to own or lease land in California until the latter now consists in reality of a very small number of Japanese. The other Asiatics who still remain on the proscribed list are so few that they need not be considered. Clearly, such a discrimination against a people of one race is contrary both to the letter and to the spirit of the Charter, which as a treaty is paramount to every law of every state in conflict with it. Now, did you hear what that said, ladies and gentlemen? Any law in this country which is in conflict with the United Nations Charter is null and void. The alien land law must therefore yield to the treaty as the superior authority. The restrictions of the statute based on eligibility to citizenship but which ultimately and actually are referable to race or color must be and are therefore declared untenable and unenforceable. Judgment reversed with directions to enter a decree in favor of plaintiff in accordance with the prayer of his complaint. Now what they're saying there, folks, is if you're a nation trying to protect the interest of your citizens and you have a law that forbids the ownership of land by citizens of foreign countries, they say that it is not really about citizenship, but about race or color. You see how they twist things? Now, if we were a sovereign nation, there would be nothing wrong with that law. But if we were, in fact, a vassal state of the United Nations, part of a larger order to which all citizens of the world belonged, then such a law could not exist. And in fact doesn't, simply because the ruling is that the United Nations Charter takes precedence over the Constitution of the United Nations, of the United States, and all laws of the United States government, and all laws of the several states. You see, ladies and gentlemen, they declared war against us long, long ago. They have been letting us believe that we have a Constitution and a Bill of Rights and that we are still the sovereign United States of America. It is a lie. We are, in fact, a subjugated people. We are, in fact, a people with an army of occupation which belongs to the United Nations and you don't have to look for foreign troops to find it. It is called the United States Navy, the United States Army, the United States Air Force, the United States Coast Guard, and the United States Marines. And in the several states where you think you have National Guard belonging to the states, and where you think that the National Guard constitutes the militia, they are, in fact, an organization that can be federalized. And if they have accepted federal money for equipment, supplies, aircraft, arms, or ammunition, or uniforms, are already federalized, which makes them another military organization of the United Nations. Wake up, sheeple. And you'd better wake up really fast. You see, it's all been done long, long ago.
run, run, don't walk, run, don't walk to your nearest telephone. Across this nation, and it probably already is in your living room tonight. For as you've been listening to me read all these documents, there was always this nagging doubt in the back of your mind. And there was always this belief that, well, you know, he's reading from these documents and I can go check it out in the library, but it just can't really be true. Well, it is true, ladies and gentlemen. The United States of America does not exist. The Constitution of the United States of America is not in force. There are no Bill of Rights. Now, for those of us who have been wondering, why is it that the Constitution has not been amended, but all across this country, they have stripped us of our rights, protected by the Constitution and by the first ten amendments, stripped our rights away. In case you don't know it, you cannot say whatever you want to in this nation anymore. In fact, if you say certain things in this nation, you can be arrested. You can be taken out of this country and tried in a United Nations court. And if found guilty of saying anything that hurt the feelings of any one person who is a member of a minority, you can be sentenced to death. Oh, yes. Read the Genocide Treaty. Read the Genocide Convention adopted by the United Nations. You have no more right to privacy under the fourth article and amendment to the Constitution. You have no right anymore to protection from the seizure of your property without just compensation. In fact, it happens every day across this country and has happened to many people today, this day as we speak. Posse Comitatus no longer applies, as you witnessed in Waco, Texas. There are no rights protected by any constitution or by any Bill of Rights left in this nation. I can go right down every single right that you thought you had, you do not have. Not long ago, they passed a law stating that confession of confessions obtained obtained by beatings can no longer be thrown out of court. Which means they can beat you until you say whatever they want you to say and that confession will stand in court. Cannot be thrown out. Don't believe it? Go look it up, sheeple. Everything I'm telling you on this program is the truth, but I do not want you to believe what I'm saying blindly. I want you to go check it. Listen to everyone, read everything, believe nothing. Now run, don't walk, to your nearest phone and call 1-800-289-2646. Never mind who it is, you'll find out when the answer. 1-800-289-2646, you need their services. You need to thank them for sponsoring this program. You need to buy a bag of everything that they've got. And you need to keep it where you can pick it up and run with it at the slightest notion. 1-800-289-2646. That's 1-800-289-2646. Do it now. A perusal of the Charter renders it manifest that restrictions contained in the Alien Land Law are in direct conflict with the plain terms of the Charter above quoted 
and with the purposes announced therein by its framers. Skipping down, clearly such a discrimination against a people of one race is contrary both to the letter and to the spirit of the charter, which as a treaty is paramount to every law of every state in conflict with it. Lest you doubt, or lest you forgot where we left off, folks, it was with the admonition that the United Nations Charter is the supreme law of this land. The United Nations Charter, it is first contended that the land law has been invalidated and superseded by the provisions of the United Nations Charter pledging the member nations to promote the observance of human rights and fundamental freedoms without distinction as to race. Plaintiff relies on statements in the preamble and in the Articles 155 and 56 of the Charter 59 Statutes 1035. It is not disputed that the Charter is a treaty, and our federal constitution provides that treaties made under the authority of the United States are part of the supreme law of the land, and that the judges in every state are bound thereby. The United States Constitution, Article 6. A treaty, however, does not automatically supersede local laws which are inconsistent with it unless the treaty provisions are self-executing. In the words of Chief Justice Marshall, a treaty is to be regarded in courts of justice as equivalent to an act of the legislature whenever it operates of itself, without the aid of any legislative provision. But when the terms of the stipulation import a contract, when either of the parties engages to perform a particular act, the treaty addresses itself to the political, not the judicial department, and the legislature must execute the contract before it becomes a rule for the court. Foster v. Nielsen, 1829, 2, Petition 253, 314, 7, L. Ed. 415. In determining whether a treaty is self-executing, courts look to the intent of the signatory parties as manifested by the language of the instrument, and if the instrument is uncertain, recourse may be had to the circumstances surrounding its execution. Now this was the argument for the plaintiff in this suit, and I skip down a little further to pertinent paragraphs. Although the member nations have obligated themselves to cooperate with the international organization in promoting respect for and observance of human rights, it is plain that it was contemplated that future legislative action by the several nations would be required to accomplish the declared objectives, and there is nothing to indicate that these provisions were intended to become rules of law for the courts of this country upon the ratification of the Charter. The language used in Article 55 and 56 is not the type customarily employed in treaties which have been held to be self-executing and to create rights and duties in individuals. For example, the treaty involved in Clark v. Allen, 331, United States, 503, 507 to 508, 67, Supreme Court, 1431, 1434, 91, L. Ed., 1633, relating to the rights of a national of one country to inherit real property located in another country, specifically provided that such national shall be allowed a term of three years in which to sell the property and withdraw the proceeds, free from any discriminatory taxation. See also Hollenstein v. Lynham, 100 United States, 483, 488 to 490, 25 L.Ed. 628, in Nielsen v. Johnson, 279 U.S. 47, 50, 49, Supreme Court, 223, 73 L.Ed. 607. The provision, treated as being self-executing, was equally definite. There, each of the signatory parties agreed that no hire or other duties, charges, or taxes of any kind shall be levied by one country and removal of property therefrom by citizens of the other country than are or shall be payable in each state upon the same when removed by a citizen or subject of such state respectively. In other instances, treaty provisions were enforced without implementing legislation where they prescribed in detail the rules governing rights and obligations of individuals are specifically provided that citizens of one nation shall have the same rights while in the other country as are enjoyed by that country's own citizens. Bacardi Corporation versus Dominic, 311, 
United States, 150, 158 through 159, 61 Supreme Court, 219, 224, 85 Illed, 98. Asakura versus City of Seattle, 265, United States, 332, 340, 44 Supreme Court, 515, 516, 68 Illed, 1041. C. Majorano versus Baltimore and Ohio Railroad Company, 213, United States, 268, 273 through 274, 29, Supreme Court, 424, 425 through 426, 53, L. Ed, 792. Chu Hong versus United States, 112, U.S., 536, 541 through 542, 5, Supreme Court, 255, 257, 28, L. Ed. 770. It is significant to note that when the framers of the Charter intended to make certain provisions effective without the aid of implementing legislation, they employed language which is clear and definite and manifests that intention. For example, Article 104 provides, The organization shall enjoy in the territory of each of its members such legal capacity as may be necessary for the exercise of its functions and the fulfillment of its purposes. Article 105 provides, 1. The organization shall enjoy in the territory of each of its members such privileges and immunities as are necessary for the fulfillment of its purposes. 2. Representatives of the members of the United Nations and officials of the organization shall similarly enjoy such privileges and immunities as are necessary for the independent exercise of their functions in connection with the organization. And it goes on, and he prevents a wonderful argument. A wonderful argument. And the result is that the judgment is reversed, ladies and gentlemen. However, however, the judgment has been and still is ignored by the executive and judicial branches of the United States government and by the states who receive monies from the federal government. Remember, the states are suborned simply because they accept benefits from the benefactor, therefore give up their sovereignty. Just as you give up your sovereignty when you accept benefits from the benefactor, the benefactor has the right under the law to call the tune to which you must dance. Whoa. <clears throat> and so, that is the end of that. I have here an article from the Los Angeles Times, dated March 31st, 1962. United States to propose end of national armies. You... United Nations force would keep global peace. That's just a headline. On the later show, I'm going to read the whole article. I don't have time right now. And then we're going to get into the Open Skies Treaty also in the later show. Maybe I do have time to read this newspaper article. United States to propose end of national armies. United Nations force would keep global peace. March 31st, 1962. Los Angeles Times. One of the world's greatest newspapers. Geneva, UPI. The United States will submit to the Geneva Disarmament Conference a plan calling for elimination of national armies within nine years and a replacement by a United Nations force, reliable sources said Friday. The American plan is to be submitted to the 17-nation group to counter a Soviet draft treaty for general and complete disarmament within four years, introduced when the conference opened here two weeks ago. You see how they work together, ladies and gentlemen? And you thought the Cold War was real? Not on your life. The American plan is to be submitted to the 17-nation group to counter a Soviet draft treaty for general and complete disarmament within four years. Introduced when the conference opened here two weeks ago. It was understood Secretary of State Rusk and William C. Foster, Director of the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency, were meeting in Washington with their advisors to put the finishing touches on the plans. Unique advantage, the West complained complained that they're... Uh, blah, 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 where am I? 
The advisors put the finishing touches on the plan. The West complained that the Russian four-year plan gives the Russians an undue military advantage in the early stages and does not include specific and detailed proposals for international controls to ensure each nation destroys its arms on schedule. The American plan was said to include these precautions as well as a United Nations peace force to maintain international law and order as national defenses are torn down. The Soviet plan omits any mention of a standing peace force. At Friday's session, the Soviet tried to commit the United States to total disarmament within four years. But American negotiator Arthur H. Dean told Soviet delegate Valerian Zorin, you cannot build a house without a blueprint. Zorin suggested the conference start taking up the Russian plan point by point, and when Dean put the brakes on the proposal, Zorin warned that the conference might be heading into another impasse. A specific study was urged. Dean proposed instead that the 17-nation group set up subcommittees to consider such specific problems and how to end nuclear weapons production, how to destroy or reduce nuclear delivery vehicles, including ships, submarines, planes, and rockets, and how to verify such measures. These are not problems of language, but of substance, Dean said. Zorin rejected the subcommittee's suggestion, first made by Rusk, and said these problems cannot be solved separately. If we are going to have general and complete disarmament, they must all be dealt with the same, at the same time and in stages. There's those stages again, folks. Zorin said... The Soviet Union is already to discuss any plan put before the conference. A statement inter interpreted by Western observers as a challenge to the United States to bring forth its own proposals. British Minister of State Joseph Godber, speaking uh, after Dean, had rejected the Soviet proposals, said general agreement on certain basic issues must be reached before they can be put into treaty form. As expected, Poland, Bulgaria, and Romania lined up behind the Soviets in demanding point-by-point -point consideration. Neutral Brazil came out in favor of the American approach. India and the United Arab Republic, the only other speakers, were on the fence. The American and Soviet co-chairmen, Dean and Zorin, met privately in the afternoon to discuss how the conference should proceed. The next session of the conference was set for Monday when the question of the deadlock nuclear test ban subcommittee will be considered. Later tonight, folks, on the hour of the time, we are going to talk about the Open Skies Treaty. We will be reading from the United States Department of State Dispatch, dated March 30th, 1992, beginning on page 257. And we will also be... Uh, reading from the United States Department of State Dispatch, March 29, 1993, Volume 4, Number 13. And many of you will be absolutely amazed to know that Soviet bombers and Soviet aircraft, both military and civilian, of both combat, logistics, and passenger carrying capability, have been and are now overflying the United States on a regular basis. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. You see, folks, things are a lot farther down the road than you ever in your wildest dreams could imagine. Got time for maybe uh, four quick calls here. 602 333 2174, if you'd like to put in your two cents about what you've just heard. 602-333-2174 is the number. Don't forget on Monday night, we're going to be talking about how you're going to make the modifications to your 375 H&H &H Magnum with a Mauser action to make the best sniper rifle in the entire world, second only to one, which can no longer be built because we cannot get that action anymore. Good evening, you're on the air. Good evening, you're on the air. Yeah, I want to ask you, what do you think about the speed reading stuff? Do you think that actually works? What are you talking about? 
you know how they advertise for speed reading? You can read real fast. And you have a lot of company. Folks, I don't remember discussing speed reading any time during the course of this program. And I don't know where these people come off the wall from. It's like I threw a tennis ball at the wall and it just bounced back and hit me right in the eye. 602-333-2174. And I don't want to hear about how you raise beans in Podunk. Okay? Good evening. You're on the air. Hi, Bill. How you doing tonight? Good. I have information here from Handgun Control Incorporated. Secret Memorandum. Monday, January 24th, 1994, 4 10 p.m. From Jerry Westfall to all, uh, I don't know what, there's a bunch of codes in the back of it. And here it is. Um, this memo talks about the laws that they want to have for guns and uh, what is pending for. Wait, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute. You're breaking up and you're not pronouncing your words. I don't know what thing you said. It talks about what? Okay. It talks about the gun laws that they want to enforce by the end of 1994. Uh huh. And uh, they have um, several things listed for that and 34 things listed for the next five years. Can I read some of them, please? Sure. And all of the clips holding over six bullets and all semi-automatics, which can fire more than six bullets without reloading, and on possession of parts to convert arms into military configuration, and on all pump shotguns capable of being converted to more than five shots without reloading. And there's a bunch more uh, going on there. And uh, including taxes on ammunition, dealers, licenses, and guns. And uh, ban on all realistic replicas or toy guns or non firearms capable of being rendered realistic. <laughs> I think they get really crazy on this. Uh, oh, they really are crazy. Carolyn, would you take a memo, please? <laughs> to the handgun, uh, what's the name of this thing? Handgun Control Incorporated. Handgun Control Incorporated. Carolyn, take a minute. To Handgun Control Incorporated. Screw you, signed William Cooper. You ain't getting my guns. And this is our Patriot, too, Bill. I appreciate your show. <laughs> Thank you. Good night. Good night. 602-333-2174. The noive. The noive. The noive of those creeps. They ain't getting my guns. Good evening. You're on the air. Good evening, Bill. I just wanted to tell all the stupid people out there that this is a collection of an international bankruptcy, and they're going to seize everything you own, including your soul. Thanks. Well, they can't get my soul. It belongs to somebody else. But uh, they can get all your material possessions in the totalitarian New World Order. You will not be allowed to own private property. They don't hide that. Good evening. You're on the air. Hello. Hello. Uh, I've been listening to your program for the last several days. Good. It's uh, it's outstanding. It's about time somebody spoke up. Unfortunately, you're not getting the national coverage that the media um, kiss asses get. But you're getting the select people. I want America to wake up. I've had the unfortunate experience of having to deal with these people who are out to steal our property, our firearms, and our lives. That's correct. That's exactly what they're out to do. And we we'll thank you for your call. We've got about time for one more, folks. 602-333-2174. If you want to put in your two cents worth, good evening. You're on the air. Yeah, Bill. Uh, related to your topic last night on that HR uh, 6, that house bill in the school, talked to uh, Congressman Hancock's office today, and is an aide that answered said they're getting call after call on that, so maybe you got to some folks. Good. I hope we got to some folks. If you haven't yet made your calls, start making calls and call every day. In fact, call twice a day. Write twice a day. Telegram twice a day. And don't stop. And uh, I had a conversation with Mel in person here earlier this week where he told me pertaining to the Federal Reserve that, in fact, it was not an entity of the United States government. That's correct. And I asked him, I said, well, 
can't we at least order some and find out what they're doing? He said, well, yeah, they need to. We've had build up, but he said, quite frankly, most of the congressmen and senators are scared of them. He said they've grown too big and too powerful to control. He said, in fact, they're out of control. That's right. Not only that, but they kill people. Right. That's okay. People have to stop being afraid of being killed. We all band together. Let's get them. Right. I agree. <laughs> I'll let someone else get in there, but I thought I'd throw that in. Okay. Well, it's too late. Good night. Okay. Well, folks, that does it for another hour of the time. Don't forget to listen tonight at uh, 9 Pacific. 10 Mountain, 11 Central at midnight, Eastern Standard Time for the hour of the time. Good night, and God bless you all. It's the hour of the time. I'm William Cooper. And I'm Carolyn Nelson. And uh, what are we going to do tonight? Well, we're going to talk about a few things, but right off the bat, before we get started, I want to uh, tell you that uh, Arizona is not the only bunch of sheriffs that are getting it all together, folks. I have here an article from the Ravelli Republic from Hamilton, Montana, Sheriff vows to defy Brady Bill. How about that? It's spreading. Ravel County Sheriff Jay Prince does not intend to comply with new federal government mandates resulting from the passage of the Brady Law, which goes into effect February 28th, and that's all I need to read from that article. Hallelujah, brother. <laughs> 
This is wonderful. I hope the rest of you are putting the bug in your sheriff's ear. One gentleman called today and said he talked to his local sheriff, and his local sheriff told him he was not going to risk federal funding to the county to try and protect the Constitution. What do you think about that? I think if you've got a sheriff like that, folks, as soon as they make some kind of a statement like that, you've got to get rid of them. Get rid of them. Impeach them for treason. That's what it is. It's treason. You cannot enforce the Brady Bill. It is unconstitutional. It's against the second article and amendment of the Constitution of the United States of America. And I don't know about your state, but it is against the Constitution of the state of Arizona, which specifically states, unequivocally, that Arizonans shall have the right to keep and bear arms. And Bill, remember, we the citizens now are monitoring what is going on in our country and in our state. So everybody out there should be in touch with their sheriffs, should know what they stand for, and should be ready to take action in case. And you should have a huge set of shark jaws made up. Uh, and if they're not doing the right thing, you should follow them around, snapping these shark jaws right behind their butt. That ought to get their attention. And there really wouldn't be anything that they could do to stop you from doing that, would there? And you in your, <laughs> in your town, your city, your county, you can have your own march. You won't have to drive all the way to Washington, D.C., as some of us did. Well, we have to do more than march now, folks. Much more than march. You have to get serious. Now, many of you in the later show, this show, did not hear the earlier one. And uh, let me quote. I'm just going to quote one paragraph from the 83rd Congress, second session, United States Senate, document number 87. The title is The Review of the United Nations Charter, a collection of documents, subcommittee on the United Nations Charter, Pursuant to Senate Resolution 126, 83rd Congress, First Session, January 7, 1954. Just going to read one paragraph, ladies and gentlemen, so that you'll know what you missed. It says here. <clears throat> The efforts of our government in this regard reached fruition in the Convention of Representatives of the Nations of the Earth at which the Charter of the United Nations was adopted. It was promptly ratified by the Senate of the United States, thereby proclaiming allegiance to its principles and providing precedent and example for other countries. The United States has consistently regarded its treaties with other nations as inviolate. The Charter has become, quote, the supreme law of the land, and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby, anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary notwithstanding. I hope you understand what you just heard, and that's from a United States Senate document published January 7th, 1950. 4. 83rd Congress, Second Session, United States Senate, Document Number 87, Review of the United Nations Charter. It's all over but the crying and the fighting and the dying and then the rejoicing. Not forsake me, oh my darling. On this our wedding day, do not forsake me, oh my darling. Wait long 
I do not know what faith awaits me. I only know I must be brave, and I must face the man who hates me. For life a coward, a craven coward, for life a coward in my grave. Oh, to be torn with love and duty, suppose I lose. My fair hair beauty, look at that big hand move along here in my room. He made a vow while in state's prison, vowed it would be my life for his. I'm not afraid of death, but oh, what will I do? If you leave me, do not forsake me, oh, my darling. You made that promise as a bride. Do not forsake me, oh. Don't think of leaving now that I need you by my side. Wait a long, wait a long, wait a long. certainly hope you don't die a craven coward in your grave. Statement by White House Press Secretary Marlon Fitzwater, Washington, D.C., March 24, 1992. Today, the United States, along with Canada and 22 European nations, signed the treaty on open skies in Helsinki, Finland. In May 1989, at a time when the immense changes seen in Europe over the past three years were just beginning, President Bush proposed that the nations of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, and the former Warsaw Pact agree to open their territories to frequent overflights by observation aircraft from the other side. The United States believes that the greater transparency in military activities brought about by such an agreement will help reduce the chances of military confrontation and build confidence in the peaceful intentions of the participating states. The Open Skies Treaty is the most wide-ranging international confidence-building regime ever developed, covering the entire territory of North America and nearly all of Europe and the former Soviet Union. Its arrangements for observation flights using photographic radar and infrared sensors and its provisions for sharing among participants the information gathered are innovative means to help promote openness and stability in Europe in these uncertain times. Open skies could also serve as a basis for similar arrangements in other regions of the world where there is a need to build confidence. The treaty establishes an Open Skies Consultative Commission in early April, it will convene in Vienna, Austria, to complete work on outstanding technical and cost issues regarding treaty implementation. The treaty will be submitted to the United States Senate for its advice and consent to ratification once this work is finished to the satisfaction of all participants. U.S. Department of State Dispatch, March 30th, 1992, page 257, Open Skies Treaty. 
The Treaty on Open Skies is the most wide-ranging international effort to date to promote the openness of military forces and activities. It is designed to improve mutual understanding and confidence by giving all participating countries, regardless of size, a direct role in gathering information about military forces and activities of concern to them. In Europe, it meets the desire of many countries to build confidence and enhance stability now that the bipolar division of the continent has ended. In other regions, this type of openness and the techniques developed in the treaty could be applied in reducing regional tensions and preventing conflict. Open Skies was first proposed by President Eisenhower at the Geneva Conference of 1955. The idea was rejected by the Soviet Union. When President Bush reformulated the Open Skies concept in May 1989, the world was on the verge of rapid change. Open Skies was proposed as a means of confidence building which would promote and consolidate existing trends toward openness. Now you notice, folks, that almost everything that you're hearing on here originated in the Truman and Eisenhower years. If you've always thought of those two gentlemen as patriots, you had better think again, for they sold this country right straight down the tubes. And then, John F. Kennedy is the one who pushed through the disarmament agreement. Formal negotiations on an Open Skies Treaty began in Ottawa in February 1990 and continued in Budapest in April, May 1990. However, it was apparent that the Soviet Union was not prepared to open all its territory to aerial observation. After the Ottawa-Budapest stalemates, negotiations were on hold for more than a year. Although the United States and other countries kept pressing the issue bilaterally, only after the abortive August 1991 Moscow coup attempt did the former Soviet Union agree to open all its territory to observation. This cleared the way, and productive negotiations began November 1991 in Vienna. The treaty was signed in Helsinki on March 24, 1992. Twenty-four countries participated in the negotiation of the treaty. Belgium, Bulgaria... Belarus, Canada, the Czech and Slovak Republic, Denmark, France, Germany, Greece, Hungary, Iceland, Iceland, Italy, Luxembourg, Netherlands, Norway, Poland, Portugal, Romania, Russia, Spain, Turkey, Ukraine, the United Kingdom, and the United States. Other republics on the territory of the former Soviet Union may, if they choose, also sign the treaty as initial participants. Georgia did so March 24th. Other countries participating in the conferences on security and cooperation in Europe were invited as observers to the negotiations, and it is expected that many of them will apply for full participation in the treaty soon after it enters into force. The treaty is open to accession by any interested country subject to the agreement of the other participants. It is not restricted geographically. Now let me ask you, ladies and gentlemen, in lieu of the fact that we have been overflying the Soviet Union for many, many years, beginning with the U-2 overflights, continuing with the SR-71 Blackbird, and of course whatever has taken its place, because they would never have taken it out of our aircraft complement, unless there was something to replace it. Also, we have a vast array of spy satellites in orbit, looking down upon the Soviet Union all the time. What is this Open Skies Treaty all about? Was it to give us access to the atmosphere over the Soviet Union? No, ladies and gentlemen, because we already had it and have always had it. And the only interruption was when they shot down Francis Gary Powers in his U-2 back during the Eisenhower administration. No SR-71 has ever been shot down, nor has any SR-71 flight ever been interdicted, nor have any of our spy satellites been interdicted, shot down, destroyed, or knocked out of orbit. So what is this all about? 
Very simply, ladies and gentlemen, it allows the Soviet Union, or what used to be the Soviet Union, what's left of the Soviet Union, which still has the entire military might intact, to overfly the airspace of the United States of America, which never was permitted before. And that's the truth of the matter. Several people called me the other day and described a very strange aircraft that they saw flying low across the desert. What they described to me, ladies and gentlemen, was a Russian bear bomber. A Russian bear bomber. Now, I didn't see it. I was going by their description. And I am telling you right now, what they described was a Russian bear bomber. You can go to your library and look up a picture of one, and you can see that there's nothing else that masses, matches that description. There's nothing else that large that matches that description that has propeller-driven engines, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I can tell you now that every day, every night, aircraft of the former Soviet Union are overflying the United States on a regular and continuing basis. Military bombers, military logistics aircraft, reconnaissance aircraft, and of course, passenger aircraft. Interesting? I would say yes. The treaty establishes an Open Skies Consultative Commission, which will meet in Vienna to monitor the operation of the treaty and to discuss and resolve any problems which may arise. The treaty is of unlimited duration and provides for periodic review conferences. For the United States, the On-Site Inspection Agency, OSIA, will be responsible for conducting and receiving open skies flights in coordination with the Department of Defense and other relevant agencies. For those of you who doubt that they're overflying the United States, they not only overfly the United States, but have landed at many major airports across the country. And yes, Soviet bombers have been part of those aircraft which have landed at American airfields. <coughs> Open Skies is not a system for gathering detailed technical intelligence, but it will enable countries to collect basic information on the military capabilities and activities of other countries, thereby enhancing mutual security and confidence. They used to call that spying, ladies and gentlemen, and they used to say, they used to say that it was not in the best interest of the national security to have another country monitoring our military defense capabilities and activities. What do you think? It is explicitly a general purpose observation system and is not tied to any arms control agreement. If it's not tied to an arms control agreement, what is the purpose other than to destroy the defense of the United States of America. Long ago, we grounded all of our B-52 alert force. We disbanded the Strategic Air Command. We are vulnerable. Extremely vulnerable, I might add. Participating countries may, of course, seek information through open skies, which would be relevant to arms control agreements to which they are parties. Raw data obtained from observation flights, for example, film, negatives, and magnetic tape, will be shared by the observing and observed countries. Oh, isn't that nice? They fly over our nation, spy on us, take photographs, take photographs, magnetic tapes, and then they turn around and give us copies so that we'll know what we already have. <laughs> That's nice. That's very big of them. Other countries participating in the Open Skies Treaty will be able to purchase copies of data in which they are interested 
from the observing country. Individual countries are responsible for their own analysis of the raw data. We're going to skip ahead now, folks. Two, United States Department of State Dispatch, March 29th, 1993, Volume 4, Number 13, Page 185. Open Skies Treaty will enhance international security, and there is the true answer. You see, it does away with our security. It does away with the defense of our airspace. But it enhances international security. It enhances the security of the emerging one world government, the United Nations. This is a statement before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Washington, D.C., March 11, 1993, by John H. Hawes, United States Representative to the Open Skies Conference. Mr. Chairman, I am honored to testify before this committee in support of the Open Skies Treaty. <coughs> As Secretary Christopher indicated in his letter of March 4th to Chairman Pell, the treaty, quote, will contribute to mutual understanding and confidence building by giving all states' parties, regardless of size, a direct role in gathering information about military forces and activities of interest to them. I hope you know, folks, that this means that Bangladesh could also overfly us. <laughs> If they can get anything off the ground. I don't know if they have anything. They probably do. <coughs> this treaty has been made possible by the dramatic political changes of the last several years when former President Eisenhower first proposed cooperative aerial observation in 1955. The idea was summarily rejected by the Soviet Union. Indeed, it was only after the abortive coup in Moscow in August 1991 that an agreement could be negotiated embodying the values of openness and cooperative international observation. In my remarks, I will briefly describe the content and operation of the treaty. Before doing so, let me put that in context by noting the four essential ways in which the Treaty on Open Skies will contribute to international security in the post-Cold War world. First, the treaty empowers all signatory states, regardless of size, wealth, or level of technology, to acquire meaningful security information on neighboring countries. This means Cuba could overfly the United States, folks. This will enhance the confidence of all participants and enable them to play more responsible roles in maintaining regional and international security. This means Haiti could overfly the United States, folks. In this regard, moreover, by generating information which can be easily shared and discussed among participants, the Open Skies Treaty will avoid the difficulties often encountered in working with restricted information. This means Japan could drop coupons for VCRs upon the United States, ladies and gentlemen, in the coming trade wars. Second, this treaty nails down the key principle of full territorial openness, all the territory of all the participants will be open to observation, including specifically all the territory of states which formally restricted large portions of their territory on grounds of national security. Now, according to our United States Constitution and the law, folks, if it weren't for the fact that our Constitution was not in effect, this treaty would only apply to that known as the federal government constituted within the boundary of that district known as Washington, D.C., Puerto Rico, Guam, American Samoa, and the United States Marshall Islands. <laughs> oh, me. I'm going to write an article for Foreign Affairs, the Journal of the Council on Foreign Relations, and submit it and see if they will print it. <clears throat> You know what? I just have a feeling they will. If they do, it's going to be very interesting. The United States insisted on full openness during the negotiations as a sine qua non for an effective confidence-building regime. 
The United States determined at the outset, moreover, that such an unprecedented degree of openness would not pose an unmanageable security risk within the United States itself. Oh, no. Oh, no. When the Cold War was going, oh, it was the biggest tragedy in the world if a little plane veered off course from Iceland and touched the tip of New York. And now they're telling us, now they're telling us, this would not pose an unmanageable security risk within the United States itself if every nation in the world can overfly our airspace anytime they want to. These people sure make a lot of sense, don't they? So when were they lying? Before or now? I think they've always been lying. Third, the treaty dramatically advances the tools available for confidence building. Yes, I think the Russians are going to be very confident now that they can overfly our country and take photographs they've never been able to take before, even with their wonderful satellites, because their satellites have never been so wonderful, folks. That was a big scam. You see, the Soviet Union was never even able to produce even the most rudimentary computer chip. Therefore, their technology has always been in the Dark Ages. Did you know that? Did you know that? Over the past two decades, the array of confidence-building measures has expanded steadily. Now the Open Skies Treaty adds to this toolkit detailed procedures for aerial observation with agreed sensors, predetermined quotas, and no right of refusal. No right of refusal. No right of refusal. Which means even if we wanted to, we can't tell them to get out of our airspace and go home and stop overflying the United States according to the terms of the treaty. It also establishes a new framework for contacts cooperation and consultation among participating states. Fourth, the treaty establishes a major precedent which may prove particularly useful in other parts of the world beyond the original signatories in reducing tensions, contributing to greater mutual understanding, and reinforcing regional peace and security. Other nations outside the Europe-Atlantic area where the treaty was negotiated have already expressed interest in the treaty. That's right, folks. Bimini will be sending overflights. Mr. Chairman, I would like to describe the principal provisions of the Open Skies Treaty relating to participation coverage, sensors, quotas, aircraft data, and costs. Yes, folks, costs. Because whenever the United States does something, they always pay for it. So we're probably going to pay for the gas and the planes for the other nations to overfly us. I mean, that's what we've always done in the past, isn't it? What makes you think it's going to be any different this time? Well, I don't know if they're going to do that or not, but, I mean, what's to cost? We've always been overflying. What's to cost? Unless we're going to pay for somebody else to overfly us. <clears throat> it gets complicated. I mean, the more you look at this, the more absolutely absurd it becomes. I think, ladies and gentlemen, the world has turned into the largest insane asylum in the universe. And we're all competing to see who can be the nuttiest. Don't go away. All day I face the barren waste Without the taste of water, Ooh, water, water. Oh, and I lie with boats burned dry and Oh, 
yes, cool water. Anybody who's really been crawling across the desert for some time knows how important cool water is. And in the coming months and years, cool water is going to become even more important. Because, folks, one of the provisions for subduing a civilian population is to poison their water supply. And you can find that in any military manuals outlining plans for occupying, occupying countries with a hostile population. Wells, water supplies, reservoirs could be, I'm not saying that they will be, I'm saying they could be poisoned or rendered undrinkable. So, how are you going to take care of that? Well, that's up to you. A lot of different ways. And when you take care of your water supply, what about your food? And when you've taken care of your food, what about provisions for the time when you run out of all of these things and you need to barter for more or for clothing or for your very life for freedom? Call Swiss America Trading right now, 1-800-289-2646. They specialize in non-confiscatable, non-reportable hard assets. You know, precious metals in its various forms has been the only thing throughout the history of the world that people have recognized as money in the hardest times, in all the times that have been hard, throughout history in all the countries of the world, with all the peoples that have ever lived. There is nothing else that is that secure or that can promise you that kind of security. It doesn't exist, folks. Unless you're able to accumulate a large stockpile of the most necessary items to human comfort and be able to staff an army to protect it and sit on top of it and use that to barter with, then you need to call Swiss America Trading. Now, don't get all caught up in this non-confiscatable, non-reportable stuff that all of these people keep feeding at you. Because that could change with the stroke of a pen, and you know it. And I know it. So, what may be non-reportable and non-confiscatable today, tomorrow, could carry the death penalty. So, act accordingly. Don't buy into all these things. Make sure that you understand that you need some kind of precious metal in one of its various forms to secure your future. Call Swiss America Trading now, 1-800-289-2646. That's 1-800-289-2646. Do it now. Thank them for sponsoring the Hour of the Time. Mention my name, William Cooper, and ask for all the available literature that you're entitled to as a listener to this program. And, ladies and gentlemen, you will be treated like a VIP, and the red carpet will be rolled out for you. boy riding in the car with my parents, old car, don't ask me what it was because I don't know, all I know it was old, my dad used to sing all these songs, all of them, 
He knew them all by heart. Streets of Laredo. All of them. Good memories. In competition with today, you know, we're all positions, ladies and gentlemen, to either be responsible for the loss of the penultimate of human achievement throughout all the ages on this earth, or, or we can bring a future into the world that will be the best that the world has ever known, based upon this nation, which has been the best, the most powerful, the most promising, has given us the most opportunity, the most freedom, in fact, the only freedom that's ever existed in this world, belonged to the American people for many years. It's gone now, but it doesn't have to stay gone, not at all, but it's going to depend upon what is in your heart and how much, how much you're willing to sacrifice to give our children what we once had or something much better. I continue with the Open Skies Treaty. From the U.S. Department of State Dispatch, March 29, 1993, Volume 4, Number 13, page 185. The Open Skies Treaty was negotiated between the members of NATO and members of the former Warsaw Pact. The latter organization dissolved during the course of the talks. Original signatories include all 16 NATO states, the East European members of the former Warsaw Pact, and five of the successor states of the former Soviet Union. Belarus, Georgia, Kyrgyzstan, I think I pronounced that right, K-Y-R-G-Y-Z-S-T-A-N, and I must be honest, I've never even seen that name before in my entire life, and I have studied the Soviet Union, I don't know how that happened, but it's the truth, the truth on this show, folks. I've got egg on my face. Russia and Ukraine. Since signature of the treaty on March 24, 1992, the former Czech and Slovak Republic has divided into two separate states. Both are in the process of reaffirming their participation in the treaty. The treaty is now open to signature by all seven other successor states of the former Soviet Union. Following entry into force, the treaty will be open to requests for accession by all states participating in the Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe. The treaty and the Open Skies concept are not, however, confined to Europe. Beginning six months after entry into force, any state without regard to geographic limitations can accede to the Open Skies Treaty, provided that it will contribute to the objectives of the treaty and has the consensus approval of the Open Skies Consultative Commission. So you learned in 1992 that anybody could overfly anybody, and now you're learning that they have a little committee there that says whether somebody can overfly or they can't. So, who's doing what to who and why, and who's been told that they can't do anything to anybody? <laughs> Amazing. Coverage. The Open Skies Treaty provides that all of the territory of participating states must be open to observation. No exceptions are permitted for national security purposes. Observation flights will follow routes set up by the observing party. Only modifications for legitimate reasons of flight safety may be proposed. The question of full territorial access was debated within the U.S. government when the initial Open Skies proposal was developed. At that time, the decision was made that full access was essential to the political and confidence-building objectives of the proposal, and that such access could be provided in the United States consistent with national security, given the previous restrictions in force in the former Soviet Union. This requirement for full territorial access was perhaps the subject most intensely debated in the negotiation. Agreement was only reached in the fall of 1991, following the abortive Moscow coup of August 1991. The treaty text not only affirms the principle of full territorial access, but also spells out how this is to be implemented effectively in actual aerial operations. The treaty does this with detailed provisions on the formulation of the flight plan to ensure that the observation objectives of the observing party will be achieved. 
That means, ladies and gentlemen, if the Soviet Union, or what used to be the Soviet Union, if Russia wants to photograph a specific top-secret military target within the United States, that we are to help them with the formulation of the flight plan to ensure that the observation objectives of the observing party will be achieved. But you just try walking anywhere near it. See how fast you get arrested. <coughs> so who is it being keeping, kept secret from? Not the Russians. Not the Russians, folks. That never has been. Once the question of access was determined, the second factor, shaping the quality and quantity of information which the participants could gather in open skies, was the package of sensors to be employed. For the United States, the sensors which have been agreed to for use in open skies will not provide a significant new source of information. Should I continue with this? I mean, this is just the most absurd... Re I feel like I'm reading a comic book. <clears throat> May I just interject? Could we Americans please have the same rights as the Russians? Well, you know, we don't really need them. You see, we don't even need this whole creed. The reason, the reason it will not provide a significant new source of information for us is because we have all the information. We've been overflying the Soviet Union for, for what, 40 years? <laughs> oh boy for most other participants however the ability to utilize the open sky sensor suite to observe the full territory of the other participating countries will represent a new and very significant enhancement in their ability to gather security related information if the country in question does not have the technology to supply the sensor rack the member nations will help them acquire the proper technology. How about that, ladies and gentlemen? The United States, however, will be a major indirect beneficiary of this increase in knowledge, confidence, and security of the other participants. This, in fact, was one of the primary considerations behind the U.S. initiative in presenting the open skies idea and bringing the negotiations to a successful conclusion. All parties in open skies will have access to sensors of equal capabilities. <laughs> and if they don't have, we'll give it to them. In the spring of 1990, the East European states obtained agreement from the United States and its NATO allies that all participants would have access to sensor capabilities equal to those employed by any other participant. Which means if Haiti wants to overfly the United States, and the little committee gives them the go-ahead, we've got to give them the state-of-the-art. State-of-the-art in reconnaissance equipment in order to be able to fulfill their mission. Thank you, Pooh. <laughs> My fan club is clapping in the background. All parties in open skies will have access to sensors of equal capabilities. This is insane. You see, folks, it would be insane if, in fact, we had an enemy anywhere. We really don't. The enemy is the people. And what's happening in the world is a great drama being played out to cause the people to ask for control on a global basis so that they can put together their one world totalitarian socialist government without a civilian armed uprising. You see, this is quite all right because the Soviet Union is not and never has been our ally. We built the Soviet Union. We gave them all of the technology we ever had. We gave them the atomic bomb. William Casey was the man instrumental in building for them the Kama River Truck Factory, which is the largest, largest rolling stock mechanized factory in the entire world, which could produce more tanks, trucks, jeeps, and lorries than all of our combined manufacturing capability together in the United States of America. William Casey 
is the director of the Central Intelligence Agency, amongst many other things, and was a member of the Sovereign and Military Order of the Knights of Malta. He was a member of the OSS and the Knights Templar. He did not die of a stroke, as you were told. William Casey, ladies and gentlemen, was not murdered, as many have proclaimed. William Casey was a man who, if called to testimony to Congress, would have told the truth. William Casey, as any good intelligence operative will tell you, committed suicide so that he would not have to do that. Because he would have spilled the whole beans about all of this. Because irregardless of what he was working to bring about in the world, he believed that he was right in doing it. And he was a truthful man. He was passionate about doing away with war. And he really believed in his heart that one world government was the only way to do it. However, he failed to understand that no matter what they implement or put into place, it will still be imperfect men ruling imperfect men. It will still be greedy men with power in their hands and lust in their hearts. And of course, when they're operating from the Luciferian principle, it is not ameliorated by the principles of mercy or understanding. Nope, it is cold and cruel and intrepid and comes strictly from a point of the intellect. There's no emotion involved, no compassion, no mercy, no heart, no love. That's what's wrong with all of these people. Ollie North was not the man that you think he is. All the time that he was operating behind the scenes, shredding the Constitution page by page, article by article, paragraph by paragraph, he was operating from a cold, calculating, cruel, intrepid point of intellect. It wasn't until he himself was caught and called upon the carpet of the Congress that he became a niche initially emotionally motivated, and his voice began to crack, and he sounded like a little boy caught with his hand in the cookie jar, screaming for understanding and sympathy. All the while, wearing the uniform of men of the United States Marine Corps. Ollie North disgraced that uniform, he was in the process of shredding the Constitution and his act in front of Congress was just that, an act and nothing more. He is in fact a traitor, but many of you have paid a lot of money into his pockets to go and listen to him talk about how he is a patriot. When are you going to wake up? When? When are you going to wake up? How long is it going to take? How many of us have to risk our lives and take the brunt of the anger of these people to try to get you to stand up and accept the responsibility of your own role in all of this? How many Carolyn Nelsons have to start out in an old broken down car and weave our way across the country, handing out copies of the Constitution and being called a crazy old lady in the, in, the, in, the, in the car over there before you all come to your senses. At what point in our history did patriotism become a dirty word and patriots become right-wing Aryan racists? How did all of that happen? And when is it going to stop? And what is going to be your role in it? 
And when am I going to stop hearing, I'm afraid to stand up, I'm afraid to say something, I'm afraid to write a letter because I might get on somebody's list. You're already on the list. There's one list. And if you're not one of them, you're one of us, and you are on that one list. And if you don't stand up with us and help fight this battle, and we lose this battle, you are going to be a slave in the New World Order. It's as simple as that. Nothing complicated about any of this, ladies and gentlemen. It is very simple. You either believe in what you've always professed to believe in, and you are willing to fight and die for those beliefs and ideals, or you have always been a hypocrite and a liar. Are you one who will not stand up now and help us fight this battle, but you patted your son on the ass and sent him off to the Middle East to die in the desert? Is that who you are? Are you one of the old war veterans who sits around in dark VFW halls drinking beer and telling lies? Or do you really love freedom? Do you really care about your children and your grandchildren? Or are you one of those who says, I don't have to get involved in this. By the time all this comes about, I'll be dead. Or my government retirement check is our only income. So I can't help. Or as many do, Mr. Cooper, in light of all that you've said tonight, what can I do to best protect my assets? I tell you now, ladies and gentlemen, you better start worrying about your ass more and about your assets less. Are you going to be left with none of all of the above? What do you think about all of this? What are you willing to do to live free, to work free, to speak free, to think free, to marry free, to live where you want to travel freely, to choose your own doctor? To choose your own income, through your own efforts, your own work, with your own brain. I've seen people around this country who lost a job on an automobile assembly line where they put two bolts in a panel and tightened them down as the assembly line moved on to the next station. And their life was ruined. They complained that they were too old to retrain for another job. And we all owed them something. When they made it impossible to me to, for me to work because of what I am doing, I simply created my own job. When they told me I could never get on radio, I laughed, and here I am. When they told me I could never say these things, I did. And when they asked me, Bill, aren't you afraid? Aren't you scared? Don't you know they're going to come after you? I asked in return, where were you when you sent me to fight and die in Vietnam? Why weren't you concerned about whether I was scared then? Or whether I was afraid? Or whether the Viet Cong or the NBA was going to come after me? Why didn't you ask that of those you sent to fight and die in de desert scam? You may know it as desert storm. Nevertheless, it is desert scam. 
the priorities of the American people are so mixed up and so screwed around and so corrupted. It will be a miracle if we can muster enough patriotic citizens to save a modicum of what we have left. And for those people, I will be here for you every night. Good night. And God